First reading of bills. I'm ready to go business. Mr. Speaker, I beg to give notice, sorry, to move the first reading of the Remote Employment Amendment Bill 2021. Question that the bill be read here first time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. Meeting, yes, yeah, have it. Government business resume. Honorable member St. Peter. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise to make a relatively brief contribution to the bill that is before this honorable chamber. And that bill relates to uh, what is referred to as control of inefficient lighting. And I think it's important to contribute a little bit, and I, I kind of reflect on what the leader of government business, the honorable member for St. Michael Southeast, said as she started. And that had to do with what does a bill that speaks to control of inefficient lighting have to do with people in Rosehill or Boscobel or Indian Ground or Spikestown or Six Mains or Mount Quarter, any place, the, the ordinary person. And the Honorable Member for St. James Central quite eloquently spoke to the context and the components of the bill. But I want to say to the people who I represent and people generally that this matter speaks to the preservation of the environment. And that is of critical importance to every person who is resident in this country. The, this bill before the House is another step in the government's program to make sure we do our part in relation to environmental matters and mitigating the, the negative impacts of what we are experiencing. And I had cause to say in previous related debates that this government is methodical so that we understand where we need to be and we are taking the deliberate steps to get there. This is a government that plans, that understands the destination and that recognizes that there are steps to be taken. And so this control of an efficient lighting bill is but one of those steps. It is, however, Mr. Speaker, an important step in our goal of being carers of our environment. Now, <clears throat> it sounded to me as if the Honorable Member for St. Michael West was suggesting that we, we, we don't really have a, you know, we're not major contributors to global warming and to all those negative environmental impacts. What I want to say though, Mr. Speaker, is that while we are not significant producers of greenhouse gases, significant carbon emitters, we, as a government, this Barbados Liberal Party um, in office as government, is very concerned about the principles that it stands by. And so while we are not significant emitters, when you look at the entire globe, we have a part to play however small that part is. And if we are to have the moral authority to speak to these matters, then in our small way, we have to demonstrate that we both understand the issue, and even though we are small in terms of our contribution, we are prepared to do what is necessary and lead morally on the issue. And so the, the, the matter of ridding ourselves of incandescent bulbs, incandescent bulbs, sorry, is a matter that we feel strongly about. We believe that even as a small country, we have a part to play. We are calling on larger countries to play their part. But when they look at us, they must recognize that we are speaking from a position of moral authority. 
we are living by the same principles that we are asking them to live by. Climate change and global warming affects all of us, ordinary people. It affects us by way of increasingly dramatic changes in our weather. So we now speak of freak storms. I used to hear about those things in the US, but I'm not familiar with freak storms in the Caribbean. We have cyclonic systems that will go from one category to four, three or four categories above in 24 to 48 hours. Significant changes. Last night, we heard news from, the, from Canada and the northeast of the United States. The highest temperatures ever recorded in some of those places, up to 46 degrees Celsius. Now, Mr. Speaker, in Barbados, when it get real hot, it is 32 or 33. Never heard of 35 in Barbados. 46 degrees Celsius. Something is happening. Something is happening. And all of us as human beings who occupy this planet have a responsibility to do all that we can to mitigate and to slow down the warming that is taking place in, or in, this, in the country and in the world. There is not only the matter of hurricane systems, cyclone systems, and freak storms, but we are also suffering from drought. And I, Mr. Speaker, consider myself to be on the front line of this because many of the people who I represent are suffering as a result of drought. The people in Boscobel have been suffering for years. And I'm happy that I've been assured by the, the, the Honorable Member for St. John that work is ongoing and we should soon have the desalination plant at Colleton, which is then supposed to feed half acre, which feeds Lambert's, and Lambert's feeds much of Boscobel. And I'm, I'm very happy about that. But the drought itself speaks to what is happening in our country, in our world, as a result of climate change. And the people of Boscobel want water. And so all of us have a responsibility to do all that we can. Climate change may not be the only issue. There, there's also the issue of pipes that have been under the ground for almost 100 years in some cases. But climate change has a part to play. And we have a responsibility. And I see that responsibility as a very serious one. And this government sees that responsibility as a very serious one. We also have situations where there is erosion in six mains. And I'm sure the, the Honorable Member for St. Michael South is going to be helping us to address that. Because the place where the people of six mains gather socially is under threat from waves and from the undermining of the structure. Now, these are real impacts on real people. And so when I stand to speak on a bill like this, control of inefficient lighting, the name sounds fancy, but it speaks to issues that impact the people that I represent. And so I share this afternoon. Now, are mitigating these negative impacts is essential and in my view takes a couple of forms. We have to move away from fossil fuels. I think that is now beyond debate, but it bears repeating because as human beings, we seem to have a connection with oil and with gas and not yet a good comfort level with moving away from fossil fuels to forms of renewable energy. I have the privilege to represent a constituency that produce the, the leader 
in renewable energy research and implementation in the 1970s and the 1980s, Professor, late Professor Oliver Headley. He was a Rose Hill man, if I may say that. And so in St. Peter, we are aware that there is that need to move away from fossil fuels and that renewable energy is a viable alternative. That has to be one plank, one part of our move to address the matter of climate change and what is happening in our world today. The other aspect of our approach has to be a more efficient use of the energy that we are producing. And this bill speaks squarely to that. The Honorable Member for St. James Central indicated, and I didn't know him at school to be a science student, but he indicated quite clearly that one of the issues with incandescent bulbs is that rather than use all the energy to produce light, some of the energy is used to produce heat. Well, it is a by byproduct. I don't think it was designed to be used to produce heat, but that is a byproduct. An inefficient use of the energy. And so this bill, when it speaks to inefficient lighting, it speaks really to the idea that we have to be careful in how we use energy. We can't be wasteful of energy. This is almost like, I, I like using scenarios, I realize sometimes though people don't like parallels being drawn. But it is like asking people to turn off lights when you're not in the room. Conserve energy. Don't go to the refrigerator 20 times in a minute. Conserving energy. Mr. Speaker, if we are to be good stewards of our environment, we have to be more efficient in our use of the energy that is produced. And so while we are moving away from fossil fuel based energy, even with renewable energy, we have to be careful about our use of that energy. And we have to be efficient in our use of that energy. It is not going to be enough to say, well, this is energy from a renewable source, so I can have bad habits. Energy must be used efficiently. This government recognizes that, and so with this move to get rid of incandescent lighting, we are going in that direction. Renewable energy has to be the driver, and we all have to be a part of that march away from fossil fuels toward renewable energy. One of the developments that I've been noticing recently is that businesses have started to take the lead in the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy, particularly in the United States. And I know some, maybe a few years ago, two, three, four years ago, much of the world was concerned that the United States was not taking more of a lead coming out of the Paris Accord and doing things that suggested that maybe climate change was not real, while well, we in the Caribbean are suffering, but some people assuming that it is not real and, and positing those kinds of false views. In the midst of that though, Mr. Speaker, we have had and still have situations where commercial enterprises are no longer looking to government, no longer looking to their political leaders, but taking the lead in this matter of renewable energy. One large company, I think it might have been Amazon, but it's time to be corrected, recently made a major investment, a major commitment to invest in renewable energy. And so while in the United States the government was going in one direction, the contribution of the country was uh, in terms of carbon emission was declining, not because of government, but because of commercial entities. I say that to say to our enterprises, 
to say to our third sector organizations, to say to all organizations in our country that individual organizations can make a difference if all the individual organizations are going in the same direction. And while in Barbados we are fortunate to have a government that is far-sighted, strategic, that understands the situation and that brings to Parliament bills like the one we are debating today, businesses and other organizations still have a role to play. And they do not have to wait on government to take the lead, but they can, in their own way, address the matter of carbon emission, global warming, and do something in relation to pushing renewable energy as the energy source of choice for this country. The Honorable Member for St. James Central touched on a matter that I think bears repeating, um, even though repeating is not ordinarily allowed with standing orders, but I think this matter of energy security is one that we have to pay a lot more attention to than we have in the past. We talk a lot about food security. We've started to speak about nutrition security. Energy security, though, is one that I think the pandemic and the shutdowns that we've had as a result of the pandemic have brought squarely into the picture. Because, Mr. Speaker, when the ship stops sailing and your economy is dependent on imported fossil fuels, imported oil, imported gas, then your economy is potentially in a lot of trouble. And so even if you have a good domestic economy, agriculture, agro-processing, you can provide food for yourself. The fuel for the tractors and the fuel for the trucks and the fuel for the processing plants, if there is no security in that area, then the domestic economic activity is compromised. And I think I agree with the Honorable Member. We have to pay a lot more attention to this matter of energy security. I referred to the pandemic, bringing it into sharp focus, but we also have to remember that weather events can also impact, and we are very vulnerable to these extreme weather events. But I also have to add to those two the whole matter of geopolitics. And the geopolitical situation in this world is at this point very, very fluid. So we, we see a resurgent United States of America. We see, uh, we see China. I'm not going to use any more descriptors. And we see Russia. So in the days of the Cold War, there were two poles. Nowadays, it seems as though there are three. And all vying for support, for influence. The geopolitical situation is that much more unstable. And that can have an impact on shipping. It can have an impact on our economy. And so that move to renewable energy has to take greater importance when we speak about energy, the, the, the fact that we need energy security. The environmental considerations, the energy security considerations are important. What is also important is the fact that Fossil fuel based energy has to be imported. And so it takes some of our GDP, it takes much of our foreign exchange to bring fossil fuels into our country to drive our productive activity, to drive our economies, and even to drive social activity. It takes foreign exchange, 
it takes some of the production of the country to be able to purchase those things. Whereas the sun will always shine. But if it doesn't, then we're not going to be here anyhow. But the sun will shine. There will be waves. The wind will blow. Renewable energy must be the way forward for us as a country. Before I conclude my brief intervention, Mr. Speaker, I just want to touch on a matter raised by the Honorable Member St. Michael West and to say to him that he is correct, that lighting in the workplace speaks in some measure to productivity in the workplace. And I'm sure that he, he did not say that assuming that he was saying something that nobody else knew. We, we know that he didn't do that. And uh, I would want to say to him that it is something that we've recognized for, for quite a long time. And it is a matter that has been addressed. We have right now at the Chief Parliamentary Council regulations to the Safety and Health at Work Act. Now that act was proclaimed years ago. There have not been regulations. And since we've come to office, we have been pushing to get those regulations completed. They cover a number of different areas, but one of those regulations speaks to lighting. Another speaks to workstations, and that also includes provisions for lighting. And so I, I would want to assure the honorable member that that matter is being addressed. We've already had all the discussions, so this is now a matter of drafting. And so we will shortly be having those regulations brought to the table, brought to the chamber, so that we can have them as part of our legislation, our legislative framework. But he is correct that poor lighting can lead to challenges in the workplace. It can lead to frustration on the part of workers. It can lead to slowdown in production. But outside of those things, seeing workers as people, bad lighting affects people's health. And as a government that is concerned about people and the whole person, we are not going to allow for situations where people's health, both physical and mental, will be impacted during the hours that they are in a workplace because of poor lighting or because of ineffective lighting. And so we will be very shortly finalizing and signing off on those regulations that will speak to the kind of lighting that will be expected and that will be accepted in workplaces. So Mr. Speaker, I want to strongly support this bill that is before the House. I think it is a well-constructed bill. The exemptions are clear. I am happy that, as the Minister responsible for Social Partnership Relations, that the Honorable Member who piloted the bill was able to speak to the level of consultation that took place in the preparation of this bill. It speaks to the ethos of this party in, gov in government. We rub shoulders. We listen to people. We let all the ideas contained so that when we come to this honorable place, we are able to come with a document, with a bill that has the benefit of the consultation that has taken place with a wide cross section of persons. And so the timelines, the business sector, they're the ones who import, who distribute. They have made input in what timelines are reasonable for them. And this bill benefits from that. This bill benefits from them saying, well, be careful because the oven in your house has an incandescent bulb. And you can't replace it with an LED bulb. And so this bill makes provisions for things like that. 
And I'm saying, I, I'm commending, Mr. Speaker, the idea of dialogue with social partners as the way to manage in a time like this. We have to consult and we have to take the ideas on board as we construct legal pieces of legislation that will allow us to effectively govern, effectively manage the society that we have been sent to this place to manage. And so, Mr. Speaker, with those words, I highly commend this bill to this honorable chamber and place behind it my very strong support. I thank you. Honorary Member for St. James Central. Mr. Speaker, sir, as I wrap up this bill, I want to, or wrap up deliberation on this bill, I want to thank all honorable members who would have participated in the debate. I particularly, sir, would wish to single out the honorable member for St. Michael Southeast, um, who would have uh, helped to focus attention of the House, and by extension, all those within earshot of her voice across the country on the question of the financial impact that this type of energy efficiency effort can have and will have on the efforts of the Ministry of Education um, and, and their maintenance program at schools can only be assisted if we can find ways and means, Mr. Speaker, sir, of redirecting scarce resources and saving those resources wherever possible so that the children of this country are in a better position. Uh, equally, I would want to thank the Honorable Member for St. Peter, sir, uh, who just took his seat and um, he, he coined a phrase there when he spoke of cares of the environment. I do believe that he meant stewards or perhaps even patrons, but um, he, did ca he did correct himself later on when he, he did use the term steward. Um, but uh, it, is not, it is not common for him to, to fall into the path of error um, <laughs> linguistically, linguistically, sir. Um, but but <laughs> but but <clears throat> more substantively, Mr. Speaker, sir, I think he guided us along a very important point because what Barbados is trying to do is to provide some serious moral leadership in a in a world that needs that direction. And let us I, I heard and listened with intent to the leader of the opposition. But I do take issue with him. Um, we, we are not, I think, guilty of overstating this issue. We must remember that perhaps the most powerful economy on planet Earth has sought to belittle the importance of climate change and has sought to belittle the impact of climate change. We who are on the forefront of it must lead by example. And we must sacrifice ourselves in doing so Mr. Speaker, in difficult circumstances because leadership is never an easy thing. The Honorable Member also addressed a very critical issue of drought. Um, you know, again, in, in, not only in St. Peter, in my constituency, it, it is felt very sharply in the Redmond Village and Welch's area, Mr. Speaker, sir, um, served by a Shop Hill Reservoir that had to, be, had to be fixed and is in the process of being fixed served, Mr. Speaker, equally by Spring Garden I Ionics desalination plant and, and the disruption to service of that plant <coughs> or diminution of service of that plant. And these are things, Mr. Speaker, sir, especially with regard to the reservoir, that we needed to be able to have the, the ability to take scarce resources and redirect money, precious money, to enable people to get water. As simple as that. And, and, and part of what failed in the last administration, sir, and I don't say this just to beat upon them, but to highlight the challenge we have of correcting years of, of misfeasance, if not malfeasance, uh, and, 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 and neglect, um, Mr. Speaker, with respect to making sure that we were able to save the country money simply by the implementation of a policy of this nature. I'm equally grateful to the leader of the opposition, sir, because while he has historically oft times been contentious, he was not so today. Um, I think, sir, that his contribution, especially with regard to pressing us more closely on studies on employee health and so on, as the, lead, as the member for St. Peter just spoke to, are useful contributions and thought-provoking contributions. Productivity, sir, um, is impacted 
by bad lighting that we understand and can be uh, impacted by bad lighting. And it creates issues, sir, of the emotional well-being of people, the motivation of people to give of their best in, in a workplace. Um, and quite frankly, even as we talk about working at home, away from the traditional workplace, it is important that at home we have those kinds of, of, of what really can only be described as efficiencies, but it does make it easier for people to give of their best, which is what we want for Barbados. So all in all, Mr. Speaker, sir, I'm indebted to the House for their cooperation. Um, and without any further ado, I would want to move that this bill be read um, second time. The question is that the aforementioned bill be read a second time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Goes against, please say no. We take the eyes out. Mr. Speaker, sir, and nobody can move that you leave um, that place so that the House can resolve itself into committee for further consideration of the bill. The question is that the Speaker do leave the chair and the House resolve itself into committee for further consideration of this bill. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. Part one, clauses one to two. Beg to move that part one, clauses one to two, stand part. Question is that part one, clauses one to two, stand part. <coughs> All honorable members in favor, please say aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Part two, clauses three to eight. Ma'am, I beg to move that part two, clauses three to eight, stand part. Question is that part two, clauses three to eight, stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. <coughs> All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Part three, clauses nine to eleven. Mama, I beg to move that. Part three, clauses nine to eleven, stand part. Question is that part three, clauses nine to eleven, stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Part four, clauses twelve to seventeen. Mama, I beg to move that. Part four, clauses twelve to seventeen, stand part. Question is that part four, clauses 12 to 17, stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Part five, clauses 18 to 20. Ma'am, beg to move that part five, clauses 18 to 20, stand part. Question is that part five, clauses 18 to 20, stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. First schedule. Ma'am, beg to move that the first schedule be the schedule to the bill. Question is that the first schedule be the schedule to the bill. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Second schedule. Ma'am, beg to move the second schedule be the schedule to the bill. Question, question is that the second schedule be the schedule to the bill. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. All those against, please say nay. We think the ayes have it. Report. Report. Beg pardon, my mom. I beg to move that the you report the passage of um, one billion committee. Question is, I do not report to his honor the speaker the passing of one bill in committee. 
All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Methinks the ayes have it. The Chairman of Committee has reported on the passing of one bill in committee. Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the aforementioned bill be read a third time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. Meeting the ayes have it. Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to move that the bill be now passed and cited as the control of inefficient lighting bill. Ah. Question is that the 2021, sir. Question is that the bill be passed and so cited. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. We think the yes have it. This bill is passed and so cited. Order number five, sir. In the name of the Honorable Minister and the Ministry of Finance, to move the second reading of the Needham's Point Holdings Limited Exchange and Issue of Bonds Bill 2021. Honorable Member Christchurch, Essential. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The matter before the chamber, sir, this represents one of the significant um, impact in relation to the to the fallout of the pandemic, sir, that has that continues, sir, to create up, um, hardship within the context of the Barbados economy. And this bill, sir, just um, really is to put a measure of relative certainty to a situation that when we came to office in 2018, sir, you would recall that we announced a comprehensive debt restructuring, which at the time, sir, was both on the domestic as well as the, the foreign debt. But this particular matter, which I will remind the chamber, um, was put to the holders of the specific um, bonds associated with Needham's Point, to the holders of that debt. And of course, I, I, I would have to, to remind the chamber that under the second schedule of the Debt Holders Act that we passed in this chamber, sir, in 2018, the Needham's Point was not considered at that time an eligible SOE in the way that other state-owned enterprises were required to, from the Ministry of Finance's perspective, to restructure their debt. Now, the reality of the situation then, sir, compared to now is starkly different because at that time, sir, tourism was, was still doing very reasonably well. The company, Needham's Point, sir, which operates the the Hilton Hotel, um, revenues were still performing at the way that they were intended in order to, to service its debt. Our view, sir, um, quite frankly, was that the entity should have, at that particular point in time, chosen to participate in the debt exchange, but it did not. And you would recall that in the second schedule of that, um, there was provision for Needham's Point to be able to come into the debt exchange offer at the time that the debt exchange was about to expire. Be that as it may, sir, um, that did not materialize at the time. And fast forward then, sir, two years, and we see the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, sir, where global travel ceased, sir, 
and with the cessation of global travel meant that no tourists were certainly arriving in Barbados, far less staying at the Hilton Hotel, and therefore the revenues that would normally be associated with that activity plummeted significantly. And therefore, the capability for Needham's Point to be able to continue to service their, their debt, sir, came into question, which is a completely different view, sir, and reality check, if you like, from what obtained two years prior um, when we contemplated the debt exchange with respect to Needham's Point. And so, obviously, sir, and, and what is, <laughs> is important to recognize is that this Needham's Point um, facility, sir, was first issued in January of 2011 and was due in the amount, sir, of $80 million. And it was due to mature, sir, in this year of our Lord, 2021. And therefore, it certainly is my view and, and those of the, the officials who were involved that at the time of the debt exchange, those bondholders of this particular maturity felt that the entity would have been in a position to continue to service debt and therefore chose at that particular point in time to not avail themselves of the opportunity sir, to restructure a debt which was too mature in 2021 and determined that they will not take up the offer at that time. But COVID now intervened because now, sir, the entity for the past 12 months, 15 months, sir, has been unable really to raise any real revenue simply because of the cessation of, of travel and the extent to which Needham's Point would be in a, in a position to actually um, repay the $80 million as it relates to, to the matter. And so the government of Barbados, in bringing some measure of certainty, sir, with respect to the matter, engage with um, the stakeholders in order to resolve this, this matter. And therefore, it is a lesson, sir, um, for all. It is a lesson for all because whilst Needham's point is not the traditional state-owned enterprise in the sense that the type of services that it offers is not necessarily, sir, and its operation on a daily basis is not necessarily linked in any way to, um, in a sense, the ordinary Barbadian, given it operates within the tourism space, even though many of us may frequent the Hilton Hotel and consume its services. Its business really, sir, is external. And to the extent that, that the, ma the majority of its business, as I say, sir, is external in the context of, of, of what it provides. And therefore, the view of the bondholders at the time was very different from what it is, what the COVID-19 reality um, demonstrated. And therefore, we are here today, sir, just to complete a process whereby the Ministry of Finance um, engaged with the stakeholders who are um, the, the bondholders to bring some certainty with respect to how the management of Needham's Point and obviously the operations here of the Hilton um, going forward will be, will be completed and allow for a swift recovery, if you like, sir, once we know that tourism can resume in full, that will give the entity itself, um, as we will say, sir, elbow room to be able to manage and maintain the kind of operations that we all know that is required um, in a post-pandemic era. And therefore, sir, the bill is a really a short bill, um, but it is important for the, the, members of, the, the members of the House, and certainly, sir, through you to the, to the wider public, that this government has built a program, sir, in order for us to be able to give relative certainty to not just the operations of central government, but certainly to its state-owned enterprises. None of us... Um, for would have seen or predicted, as you say, the onset of COVID 
and certainly the, white, the impact of COVID-19 on the economy is real. We've lost just about 18%, almost 20%, sir, of the economy. Most of that, sir, is tourism-related um, um, activities, of which Needham's Point is, plays, um, is a critical uh, player in that space. And therefore, the bill here gives the authority for us to be able to exchange, um, first and foremost, sir, the bonds that was issued by um, Needham's Point at Clause 4, and to issue Series B, sir, um, to the bond to the bond the holders of of the original um, 80 million exchange um, a bond that was issued. No, sir. The reality is, and I've heard. I take this opportunity just to address very briefly some comments that I have seen and heard circulating in the context of the amount of debt that the government has been accumulating. Um, which I should say at this particular point in time, given the impact of the pandemic and the, and the fall in revenues that prior to April 1st of last year, we did not anticipate that this government, because we had started a serious program of fiscal consolidation, sir, with respect to the work program, that the amount of debt that we've had to undertake in the last year, sir, is as a result of COVID-19, number one, and to place on record, sir, that it was never intended as, as part of this government um, to borrow the monies that we had borrowed last year, because those were not programmed into um, what we had initially planned to do. But it's important to set the context, sir, that coming out of a debt restructuring, that in order to continue to provide the level of services that we, we had intended, sir, at the outset of the, of the work program to deliver, two, sir, to settle the over $1.2 billion in arrears that we found and had to, to set in a, a program in place to repay, that that the operations of government, sir, could not, could never, ever really be able to do that, as well as to execute, sir, a capital works program which is intended to help deliver growth in the country. And therefore, the quantum of debt that is being undertaken and the cost of servicing that debt, sir, is significantly less compared to what the previous administration, sir, because you would recall, sir, the last set of monies that the previous government borrowed officially from the market ended up costing the government um, in the region of in excess of 12% in order to be able to service. And the truth is, sir, in economics, in the practices of, of economics, and the truth is, sir, in most, um, in most households, and, and, and how you look at it, sir, you don't ever take on, sir, more debt than what it will cost in, in terms of being able to, to service it. So put simply, sir, we have been borrowing from the multilateral, sir, for the most part, and certainly the debt that we've undertaken in the last year. We have borrowed from the IMF, and, no, and, and happy to, to, and the country is already aware that the World Bank has approved an operation last week, Thursday, sir, in the amount of $200 million. But this debt is, the cost associated with this debt, sir, is at 1.1% interest. And the considerable point, sir, is that the ability for the government of, and the people of Barbados to be able to grow the economy, sir, to be able to service that debt means that in coming out of this pandemic, sir, we would have been able to not just finance our way through it, but be able to help propel growth, sir, which we anticipate will be over and above the 1.1 percent, which is the cost of the debt associated with this. And quite simply put, sir, once we continue to grow, coming out of the pandemic, then we know that the, obviously the ability to service the debt that we've undertaken will be 
in place and that the sustainability question obviously then becomes just a matter of insurance sir, that we can actually improve the level of services that we can create the kind of environment that is conducive to investment and that we are continuing to maintain the fiscal discipline that brings the, the, the wider level of confidence to the economy. And so it is important in that context, sir, to, for, for Barbadians to appreciate that we simply cannot get out of the hole that the previous administration dug for all of us, that they dug for all of us, sir, unless we were able to help finance and do some of the things that many Barbadians have been asking for for a very long time that this government over the past 37, 38 months, sir, have been responding to. And therefore, it is really a part of our fiscal program that really allows us to be able to take on this debt. The reality is, though, sir, yes, we had in the response to the pandemic to take on some debt. But the ability for the government and the people of Barbados to be in a position in the first place, sir, to take on that debt was because we had implemented already, sir, key reforms that makes Barbados's name, sir, good in the market again. We continue, sir, to pay the arrears that the last government had left in place for us, and we continue to do that, sir, despite the fact that the revenues um, have fallen. But the reality is that these are the things, sir, that will help to deliver confidence in the government of Barbados, that will help post the pandemic, sir. And I really hope, sir, that we can see the back of this pandemic soon, 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 because it, is, it, is, it, is, it has created a level of uncertainty, certainly um, within the household sector, sir. And the previous debate spoke to some of that anxiety in relation to to that and obviously to the extent then that that uncertainty is then seen or felt within the context of the business climate it's just the reality sir and therefore um, we are doing what we can to not just maintain the level of um, social protection measures that we have in, put in place but equally sir to ensure that we can maintain the suite of public goods and services Notwithstanding the fact, sir, that we've had to, to, to respond very aggressively to maintain a very aggressive um, public health posture to be able to manage the pandemic. But the reality is, sir, we couldn't do that if nobody was prepared to assist the government and the people of Barbados. And I say that knowing that the last government, sir, couldn't even borrow to buy cert for a snow cone carrot, sir, based on where they had brought the country to prior to us taking over. And the reality of our situation was there is, even in the context of the economy, sir, declining almost 18%, by 18%, sorry, there is still that relative confidence within the context of the management of, of the country that would see people still want to assist Barbados at a time when its economy is that it's perhaps most vulnerable. And it's at its most vulnerable simply because, as you know well, sir, um, we are monitoring the, the development of the Delta variant globally and what that potential may have or mean for our travel. And we want to be in a position, sir, to help to vaccinate as many Barbadians as possible so that we can not just continue to open and remain open, but also at the same time, sir, to ensure that we can welcome back visitors in a safe way that helps to keep the economy open. And therefore, that uncertainty around the speed at which we can get our people vaccinated, the speed at which we can get access to vaccines, the trajectory of the variants globally, when travel resumes, sir, means that there, there is a point that between when this pandemic hit, sir, and the duration where things have to be financed, sir. And the reality is that we have, been, we have acted responsibly. We have engaged our um, international partners 
And I think Barbadians, sir, would come to appreciate um, in time to come that the way that we have chosen to be able to finance our way through this very tough period is indeed the, the responsible approach, sir, the responsible approach, and that this government will continue to manage its affairs, sir, on behalf of the people of Barbados to be able to maintain the mandate that was given to us um, three years ago to bring some measure of respectability and credibility back to the good name of the country of Barbados. Now, sir, yes, the economy has, has contracted. And this bill before the chamber is just representative of a microcosm of that. Because with the 18% reduction, sir, in GDP, and for the, in the context of this um, entity, almost 100% <laughs> fall in revenue. Because as you will know, you recall, sir, and um, through you, all last year when we were trying to figure out what we were doing, things were, were, were shut down for the most part. There were no tourists coming. There were no activities taking place. We were normally, most Barbadians would probably go to Hilton for breakfast on a Sunday morning. All of these things, sir, there was great uncertainty. And therefore, the Hilton slash Needham's Point holdings uh, responsible for that area would have seen almost 100%, sir, 100% cessation of business. It is only when we, at the turn of this year, sir, when we started to include to some degree, sir, hotels as part of the apparatus with respect to quarantine, that they started to see a little bit of activity come back. But that's not the kind of activity, sir, that is really associated with the hotel. So I know that earlier this year, for example, when you would recall the outbreak, sir, at the prison, um, the Hilton Hotel in this instance was used as part of the, the one of the facilities to accommodate um, some of the prison staff in associated with that exercise. But the reality is, sir, is that that is not really, yes, they would have gotten some monies from government, but that is not really the kind of activity that is normally associated with the Hilton Hotel and the range of activities that it provides, not just to Barbadians, but certainly to, to visitors. And therefore, almost a 100% drop in, in revenue over the last year. And therefore, it is important and to set the context that the government of Barbados, the people of Barbados, owns the Hilton Hotel through Needham's Point, a company that is set up to be able to manage and run it. And we have determined that this is the appropriate path that would allow for that entity to be able to continue effectively, sir, um, against all the odds, to effectively be able to still continue, sir, as a going concern, because we, I remember as a, as a young, I can't remember who was at university, so I remember when the, the Hilton was imploded um, that morning, that Sunday morning, I think it was, um, and all of us saw what came out of that, and therefore, as a, as a Barbadian, I think it is, it is, it is, it, it really, um, it would be responsible for us to ensure that we can allow that lovely piece of real estate, that investment, that, that, that piece of the pie, if you like, sir, as it relates to, to Barbados participating within the, the tourism sector, that we give it the best opportunity, sir, to be able to come out of this recovery of this pandemic, sir, um, as we hope the recovery will deliver and be able then to, to be much more um, viable and, and to the extent then that um, not just the, the, the workers, but all of the suppliers and the operators who, who benefit from the traditional type of activity that, that usually takes place in that space, that I hope that in the not too distant future that we'll be able to see not just the full resumption of, of tourism, but certainly the, the, the range of activities that we as Barbadians would normally consume at the, at the Needles Point um, um, Peninsula. And effectively, sir, see a, a transformation of the type of services uh, and, and the opportunities for, for Barbadians to, to participate in that space to be able to see that come to fruition, sir. And we believe that this provides enough scope to be able to 
give the entity the ability to be able to move forward and be, be, be sufficiently solvent to be able then to, to continue on its path for not just the upgrades, but certainly improve the quality of services that it would provide. And so we must appreciate that whilst, yes, the, the economy fell by almost 20 percent, in this case, this entity lost almost 100 percent of its revenue. And you, 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 you really cannot, and I know that they are par also participating within the context of the best program as well, and because obviously you want to keep as many um, employees um, in the space as, as possible. And, and the truth is, sir, that this has been a very challenging time for all um, players within the context of the, of, the, of the tourism sector. But the uncertainty, and I know that we have only just recently been placed on the green list um, for the United Kingdom, and we know that foreign bookings are looking very positive. But the reality is that until we get these hotels back into operation, and Barbadians are going to work steadily for five, six, seven days a week, sir. Um, I mean, not overworking it, but I'm just conscious that the Minister of Labor is within, within a, 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 a stone's throw from me. But the reality is I know people want to get back to work. That's the point, sir. People want to get back to work. They want to be able to support their families. And we believe that this gives the, 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 first, the, the entity a, a, a breathing space to be able to focus on absolutely delivering the best possible service that it can provide by bringing along as many people as possible. And we too, sir, look forward to that day when not just Barbados is reopened, but the truth is the globe has to reopen. And I take this opportunity now to say to Barbados as well, sir, that I know that we are very hesitant. As my grandmother said, we are frightened people sometimes. And the truth is, we too have to start traveling again at some stage because the planes go both ways and the cost associated with putting on flights and all of that, sir, is important. And I know that we are doing our best to be able to vaccinate people and in order for, for global travel to resume and for things to get back to normal, then we have to have a perspective. We ought to understand the protocol. So in the same way, that we expect persons when, when they come here to follow our protocols, then we have to equally be, be prepared to be able to do, to do the same when we travel. Because at the end of the day, sir, um, the airline business is, is costly. And we want people to come. But I'm saying to Barbados that at some point, even though I know that things are a bit tough, that at some point we have to start to, to think about what it is we are doing within the context of our own affordability. So I, I don't want any, anybody on the news or the social media to, to say that I tell people to travel, sir. That is not the, the, the message. It is that we, we have to appreciate that within the context of bringing business back to entities like Needham's Point and the Hilton Hotel, that it also requires that Barbadians um, equally um, participate in that because that is where the, the load factors um, increase for the airlines and therefore costs then can, can normalize such that travel can become relatively affordable um, again. But the debt that the government is taking on now with respect to Newlands Point and effectively the Hilton Hotel, sir, um, has come about after a, a a range of consultations, sir, <laughs> which I, I, I will not go into the, the obviously the details, but a range of, converse, of consultations that will see the issuance of the Series B bond, sir, and there's nothing different about the, there's absolutely nothing different about the Series, e, series B bonds um, from, from before, and therefore is consistent, sir, with what we would have done in the initial debt restructuring. And therefore, um, the 15 years um, structure of the, of the series, series B bonds obviously are the same as they were before. And therefore, um, natural disaster clauses and everything, sir, um, are included. And to the extent that um, the bondholders will have relative certainty 
um, as we did with the previous debt restructuring, um, is in place. Um, uh, the, in the schedule, sir, um, as you can see, the, the full natural disaster clause is um, identified as, as, as before and, and sets out the conditions within which the natural disaster clauses would apply, which is consistent with what we would have passed in, what we passed, sorry, in 2018 in relation to, to the debt. And so, sir, this is, as I said, is a very, very short um, presentation. And I, I, I hope that it really does create a little um, space, um, not just for the entity, but certainly for the players within the context of, of the, the, the investment community to be able to look at what is required now with respect to um, the potential reinvestment or redevelopment of Needham's Point and be able then to, to, to move the, the process forward, sir, um, with, some, with some haste. And so, sir, um, this is really to give a little lifeline to a very dire situation um, for, the Hilton, um, for the Hilton Hotel. We are working, um, I know the Ministry of Tourism has been hard at work in trying to bring back as much activity as it possibly can, given the various restrictions that they have internationally. And I'm absolutely confident, sir, that, that on resumption, that we can get the hotel occupancy back up to reasonable levels. And therefore, from an operational perspective, that the breathing space that, that this um, will provide will allow the entity to be able to enhance um, its product offering, whilst at the same time being able to ensure that the staff, sir, um, perhaps are adequately compensated um, with respect to in a, in a, in a, in a new, new product, product offering and would allow for ordinary Barbadians um, to start to, con to consume some of those very services that I mentioned before, whether it's Sunday breakfast, whether it's a wedding, whether it's reception, normal meetings, and all of those kinds of activities that we have, in a, in a true sense, are taken for granted that those things can resume to help support the operations of the Hilton Hotel. And so, sir, with those few words, I beg to move that this bill be read a second time. Thank you very much, sir, uh, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member for Christchurch East Central has in his usual calm and reassuring tones spoken to a lot of issues in a relatively short time by his standards. But really, in my opinion, Mr. Speaker, and I, I believe I'd find some concurrence with you were you to give the matter some thought, that this debate is really about two things. One, government's capacity to take on debt and service its debts. And similarly, the capacity of Needham's Point Holdings or Hilton Hotel to take on debt and to service its debts. Some of what the Honorable, much of what the Honorable Member said before he sat suggested that the lamentation, the lament, which now comes out of the Needham, the Needham Points, the Needham Points situation, the Hilton situation, is to be blamed on the loss of economic activity due to the negative impact of COVID. Anybody with any modicum of understanding would recognize that that is partly true. I think equally they would recognize that that is not necessarily wholly or fully true. And therefore the question has to be raised as to the 
viability of the Hilton's operations, or the Needham Point's holdings operation, uh, prior um, to COVID, the question I would pose would be, since this is an asset which government, this administration, would have been quite loath to part with, it had become apparently clear, I see a look of query on your brow, Mr. Speaker, it had become a matter of public interest and concern that there was some thought given to being rid of this asset in the interest of generating some foreign exchange revenue for government in the period before this administration. This government was much set against that, and I'm not saying that they were wrong. That's not my point. The, the point is, the point is, Mr. Speaker, that you're dealing with an asset which is considered to be a prized asset in the context of the Barbadian economy, not only the tourism sector, but by extension, the wider economy. It's an asset in which the people have a significant interest. The question would be, therefore, my concern would be, my interest would be, to what extent are we positioning the Hilton to earn and to adequately earn so that it may properly fund its operations and meet its obligations. It is one thing to incur debt. As the honorable member rightly said, you have to be able to service effectively and punctually that debt. That debt must be repaid, therefore, either by ourselves or by those who come after us I am not as assured as the Auburn member for Christchurch East Central, the Minister of State and the Minister of Finance. I am not as assured as he is, and I suspect that you may not be either, Mr. Speaker, as assured as he seems to be, that this economy in the foreseeable future will be able properly to service its debt in the persistent absence of any significant platforms of growth being constructed. I am not as persuaded as those on the other side, certainly not as persuaded by any of the ministers of state in the uh, Ministry of Finance or the minister herself, that we are so properly positioning and platforming the economy for growth that debt servicing down the road by this economy, by this state, is going to be as easy a thing to manage. Those who come after us, who will find it a very challenging thing to find rewarding employment, appropriately rewarding employment, employment that matches their skills and their hard um, efforts at study, will be in a position to help this country repay the debt that it continues to accumulate. So the question is, how are we positioning the Hilton to earn? There has to be a relationship between the debts that we incur or the revenue, I said, the, well, the income that we derive from debt and the income that we derive from earnings if we are to effectively have an operation that is viable. So my, my concern, and I think the concern of many, Mr. Speaker, I'm trying to say, would be that are we ensuring that there are appropriate ratios existing between the funding we are deriving through loans and the funding that we are deriving from earnings in a context where we continue to see that debt spiral. Now, government is attempting to give some certainty, to use the words of the honorable member who last spoke. It is an effective guarantee, or effectively it is a guarantee um, to those who hold bond interest in the entity. And I believe that in a context such as we operate in this economy, where capital is often scarce, or where it is 
where it abounds to some extent, relatively speaking. It is timid. Government has to step in often and carry the day and provide effective guarantees in certain situations. Now you're providing a guarantee against the interests of those who hold uh, bonds in relation to the operations um, with respect to Needham's Point and, and, and Hilton. So that is understandable. But though it be necessary, a government must always act with prudence and with care. And we are still very much alive in that time where our memories have flashbacks and those flashbacks don't carry us way back. They're almost in our immediate rear view mirror, to use a familiar phrase, um, with respect to 124 million related to the operation and the investment, the failed investment down at Four Seasons near the constituency of the Honorable Member of St. James Central who would clearly understand what I am talking about. Now, so whereas it is understandable that government must give these guarantees, must sometimes step in to lend certainty to these situations, prudence must be very much the order of the day when it comes to these guarantees which effectively give certainty to these big investments and the, the interest held by many in these investments. And the story is yet fully to be told with respect to 124 million. That is one of the numbers which um, one often hears reference in public debate in Barbados today. And the story still yet, therefore, must be fully told about that 124 million. So this 80 million or so um, is short of that by some significant number. The point I'm making, Mr. Speaker, and I hope it is clear by now with all of that, is that government sometimes has to do these things. But you have to be very prudent and cautious about doing it. And when it has been done, there must be transparency and accountability in relation to these matters. And I think Barbados is concerned with reference to 124 million down in um, the Black Rock uh, area, an area known to you, Mr. Speaker. So on either side of Carolel Bay, so to speak, there's money being spent or invested, if I may more euphemistically put it, by the government of the day, taxpayers, money in operations of which there must always be um, clear trans uh, transparency and clear levels and mechanisms for accountability. You get into debt, you have to be able to service your debt and therefore those appropriate ratios must obtain among the operations. You can't let it get out of whack such that you're borrowing much more than you are earning. That is the state of things with the country itself borrowing far more than we are earning. And we've got to be careful that with respect to the operations at Hilton, we don't let things deteriorate to a situation, if it is not already there, where we are borrowing far more than we are earning. Operations need to be supported, they need to be planned for, needs to be strategic planning, capital expenditure must be provided for, and I think within the world of hotel operations, especially with an entity of this size, capital expenditure, what they call retention of capital expenditure, is usually said to be around four or five percent that is set aside for what you must do every five, six, seven year cycle to refurbish your plant and to make sure that the facility that you operate remains competitive and attractive to the world. So these things need, we need to ensure are ongoing with reference to the Hilton, because if they are not, then taxpayers' monies are being put on the line, and we do not want to hear later a story of either regret or apology with reference to that type of matter, Mr. Speaker. Now, these relationships, like I said, between borrowings and debt service, um, between earnings, and 
um, loans, because there will be other loans that the entity would have, not only those uh, that revolve around the interests of bondholders, but there are other loans, I'm sure, that the entity would have, and therefore these things have to be seriously questioned, seriously understood, and clearly um, made public so that the Barbados taxpayer could be assured that the government that spends its money on its behalf is doing that which is um, prudent. If you have investors, you have people with sheer interests, you have to ensure that you are in a position to respond when the time comes. The lament we hear today is that Hilton is not in a position to do that. The lament we hear today is that the negative impact of COVID has brought this about. My concern is that perhaps it predates COVID and it is bigger than the COVID period. And we have got to get a more assured sense of the realities which obtain. The Honorable Mem uh, Minister of Energy will be quite concerned. And those who have the interest of the future growth and viability of the Needham's Point, the wider Needham's Point projects, would be concerned about the environmental liability which still exists around the old mobile site. I raise that in this floor, on this floor, perhaps in the other building, your other house, Mr. Speaker, um, two years ago, maybe. And um, I was given the assurance to take the Minister of Energy then spoke that the matter was being addressed. Well, I don't know that we've had an update as to what is going on. But my sense from what I had learned about the situation then is that it was an absolute peril waiting to befall somebody individually or in a more community-oriented context, the people of Barbados. And it would be good if we could have an update as to what is happening around the cleanup and otherwise related matters um, revolving about the the mobile, uh, the old mobile um, site and facility. These are con concerns I have, Mr. Speaker. All I'm simply saying, government must do these things from time to time, but let's do it cautiously, let's do it prudently. Let's not just blame this thing on COVID. Let's examine the viability of the Hilton project. Let's see what the debt profile is saying. Let's see what the relationships are between the debts being incurred, the ability to service that debt, the, um, the ability to fund your operational um, activities, et cetera, so that we are not just um, shelling out money. Uh, and I, I don't want to say willy-nilly, I don't think we've descended to that level, but not just shelling out money without due care and diligence on behalf of the people of Barbados. I think the people of Barbados do view the Hilton as a prized asset. I think the majority of the people of Barbados would not want to see Hilton sold, so to speak, as, 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 as an asset. But they must be concerned, as there is nationally, with the buildup of debt and the incapacity to service that debt. And we have today a government taking on a debt responsibility on behalf of the entity when the government itself is significantly challenged with respect to managing its own debt in a context where growth platforms are not being efficiently and effectively constructed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Mr. Michael South Central. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I arise this afternoon. Honorable Leader, can you turn off your Sorry, sir. I rise this afternoon in support of this matter that is before the Honorable House. In, but also in general, sir, uh, to respond and to discuss and to air a bit the issues that arise from this conversation that we are having, from the, the issues that would naturally arise and the questions that the Honorable Leader of the Opposition so innocently frames as questions. Uh, you know, you can ask anything as a question. 
And once you frame it as a question and say, and suggest, well, I'm just asking a question as what I have heard out there, well, you could say anything. But that's OK, because we cannot say anything. So I also want, though, to be fair to on these matters of debt and debt service and borrowing to be able to address some notions out there. I know, sir, that debt is often seen as a bad thing. Among Barbadian people, among us, culturally, we feel as if we don't want to owe anybody anything. I know that growing up, that has been very much something that I sensed in the public discourse. But the truth is, sir, that debt and credit are important things. And the Honorable Member for St. James Central, in his work in the Ministry of Commerce, in his work on financial, financial literacy, will no doubt agree that this question of having a record of credit, having a record of borrowing, being able to be considered credit worthy as you go about your business is very important. So in the financial systems in which we operate both domestically and internationally, it is important to have an established credit worthiness. It is important to be able to be considered worthy of credit, that people trust, that you can so manage your affairs that if they take their money and put it in your hands, that they can expect to see it again. The last administration was not so considered in the international community. I, I, and I want to say something. You know, we talk about not looking back. We say, and when I say we, I mean the public narrative. We all say, all right, that's fine. That happened, but get on with it. But I don't tend to agree with that. We are getting on with it. We are facing and fixing the issues. But we have to have a record of where we're coming from. That's the only thing where we'll know where to go. Sir, in 2018, when I assume some responsibility for economic affairs and investment. The partners, the multilateral banks and, and financing partners with whom the government of Barbados had been dealing made it very clear at that time that based on much of the recent work, based on the immediate work to reform public financial management systems, based on the immediate work to restructure the debt, based on the immediate work to address central bank borrowing limits, um, central bank limits and, 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 and central bank governance that this administration took on. Based on all those things, those creditors, multilateral banks, were now ready to talk with us again. One particular bank said to me, before, there's a, there's a type of assessment that we need to do to, to establish that a country is credit worthy. There's a multilateral development bank. There's a type of assessment that we need to do to establish that a, that a country is credit worthy. We did not even try to do it before because Barbados would have failed. And we didn't want to put the country in that position. But now we can do the assessment. And now Barbados would pass such that Barbados can borrow again. The issue of being credit worthy in our international financial systems is important. So I, I, I'm trying to open a dialogue, sir, through you with the people of Barbados that we represent to say that debt and an ability to borrow are important. Now the issue is also ability to repay. And, and, and I want to say something about the issue of debt service and the issue of terms of debt. The average interest rate 
of Barbados' portfolio for new borrowing. Barbados' new portfolio of borrowing is about 1%. It's about 1%. Now, yes, interest rates are low. That is true. But I also want to say something about what taking on debt looks like. And, and sir, permit me to, ha to just have a conversation about it. Because I think that there's a notion that you walk up to a bank, and, and, and let's face it, we're talking mostly here about multilateral debt because we're not borrowing on capital markets much yet. So we're talking about the IDBs, the CDBs, the Latin American Development Banks, um, the European Investment Bank. That's who we're talking about. But I think there's a notion that you walk up to a bank and you knock and you say, please to lend me $100 million. And they say, OK. <laughs> but that doesn't happen anywhere in the world. That doesn't happen. You, you can't walk up to any commercial bank and, and, and not have to prove anything, not have to show anything, not have to give anything. But what is it in the case of Barbados that we have to show? The majority of the, of the borrowing that we've done at the average interest rate of 1%. The majority of that borrowing has been what we call policy-based loans. What does that mean? It means that the government is able to borrow at highly concessional terms. Concessional terms meaning not at all burdensome to your macroeconomic position. That's what concessionary means. It means that you have a low interest rate. It means that you have a long grace period, so you, you go a, a certain amount of time without, without repaying. It means that you have a long maturity. You have plenty of time for the instrument to mature and to be able to pay back. Those are concessionary terms. And that, that is how we can describe the majority of the new portfolio of policy-based lending that this Barbados Labour Party government has gotten in, has gotten into. But sir, you don't just walk up and, and say please for this money and get it. For the policy-based loans, you are able to borrow based on certain policy commitments that you are shown to be doing for the health of either the economy or the health of a particular sector. No, sir, that calls for work. When we talk about negotiating loans, when we talk about um, being able to go before a board of a multilateral bank and show a board that we have done the work of governance, that we have done the work of sustainable development, as in the case um, with a loan that we, are, that we, we negotiated um, a year ago that we have done the work to make sure that, cre that we create the environment for good economic management, that we create the environment for sustainable development and, and climate resilience. These are the kinds of things that, this, this is the kind of work that you do for your country and for your people on which basis you're able to borrow. So that's policy-based loans. And sir, you forgive me if I go into a little bit of a Lesson, no, the, the, the Honourable Member of St. Michael South East, the Minister of Education, would, would bear with me for sure. Um, but I, but I, I, I want to be able to say these things. I'm not trying to teach people or talk at people. I'm trying to share what this work looks like. So that's policy-based loans, which you're able to borrow on the basis of making certain policy changes that are good for your country. And, and every loan agreement is for public consumption. Everything that we've said that we would do, whether it is a new customs bill or whether it is a new stormwater management plan, everything that we've said we would do as the basis for lending is clear. It's, it's there for everybody to see. So that's the policy base side. And then there are investment loans. And what are investment loans? It's money that you borrow to be able to execute a particular activity. Now the policy based loans 
growth hit the reserves. In fact, I dare say that a big part of the reason that we have the buffer that we have at, say, around 2.6 billion in reserves, the highest ever, is because we've been able to borrow at concessional terms, as well as having had some significant impact uh, in, in recent months in the international business sector. But this is no small thing. This idea, oh, the reserves are propped up on borrowed funds, but there, at least there are reserves. You can imagine if we had COVID in 2016, what would have happened then, sir? At four and a half weeks of reserve cover? The reserves are there not just as a last resort um, to provide, with, to, 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 to supply the commercial banking sector, but the reserves also stabilize the dollar. You imagine having to deal with COVID and ash and freak storm and a dollar that isn't holding? So I want us to understand that the things that we did at the beginning of 2018 were the reason that we have been managing these multiple crises in the way that we've been able to manage them. So you have policy-based loans, or you have investment loans that, are, that are, are borrowed for the very important things that we have to do. The, 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 the United States came almost to a standstill recently on this matter of infrastructure. Because the new president stopped and looked around and said, well, hang on. All of the infrastructure of this country is crumbling before our eyes. The whole world is realizing that, actually. Barbados is not the only country that's having to deal with investments at scale in infrastructure. But, the, but you cannot take your resources from the Consolidated Fund and put all into major infrastructure projects. Because then, how would you be able to support and to fund and to finance the regular operations that have to keep a country turning over? And so it is good economic sense to be able to borrow at reasonable terms for major long-term infrastructure projects because they, they will then give you a return over an extended time that matches the maturity of the loan. So you know that you take an investment loan to build a road because the road is going to be there for a long time. To buy buses because the buses are there for a long time. But let us not believe that we do not have to invest in infrastructure and we do not have to invest in maintenance to make sure that that infrastructure can last a reasonable, can have a reasonable life cycle. Because if you don't invest in the maintenance, then the value from that loan is, is diminished. So sir, not only did we put this country in a position to be able to even be able to, to, to imagine Barbados could not, would, would, would have gone up the road to the bank and the guard would have said, mm -mm, not in here. Not in here. Don't even pull the door. Don't even sanitize your hands when you're coming in here. We put ourselves in a position that we had, could, could have an audience again with the multilateral community. Yeah. Sir, the interest rate that was eventually, that eventually obtained on that Credit Suisse loan, that famous or infamous Credit Suisse loan, at the end, I believe, was about 13%. I want us to pause and understand that the average interest rate on a new lending portfolio for Barbados for policy-based operations is 1%. The interest rate that the last administration had to contend with on the Credit Suisse loan was 
100%. By the time all of those downgrades had happened, because that's the price you pay for poor economic management. You feel your interest rate stays, stays there. You feel you're mismanaging an economy and your interest rate stays there. You've got to pay the price. And so that variable interest rate that they negotiated, if you could call it that, continued to climb and climb and climb because of the downgrades that they subjected us all to. And, and eventually it ended up at 13%. Now, what's the, what's the importance of, what's the significance of that interest rate number, sir? The significance of that is that, in general, we say that your average interest rate of your portfolio is sustainable if, it, if you can conceivably grow at that same percentage. So that in order to maintain debt service, in order to maintain this 1% average, the economy of Barbados would need to grow by 1%. Now, the last report of the government of the central bank, I believe, was estimating one to three percent growth, forward growth for the economy. Now, if you had to deal with that average interest rate of 13 percent, tell me when is the last time the economy of Barbados grew 13 percent, sir? The point I'm making is that the debt trajectory that we have set is sustainable because we have a plan through the renewable energy sector, through an enhanced and diversified visitor economy sector, through the medicinal cannabis sector, through, through an aggressive capital works program, and many uh, through a, 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 an improved doing business environment to get growth going. Through an agriculture sector to get growth going. So the point, sir, is that, you know, I think that we believe that even in the context of multiple crises, we shouldn't have to shift and adjust. Developed countries are borrowing, are printing the world of money, they can do it because they're printing in, 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 in the reserve currency. So they control the international financial system such that the rules for them are different from the rules for us. But the developed countries in the context of COVID and the, and the, and the deficits that they're facing are finding themselves having to print money, having to borrow far more than we are borrowing. How is it that we believe that we can finance health care, infrastructure, and all of the other critical things that we need to finance without borrowing in a sustainable way, one, and without borrowing to do things that are going to give us returns in the future? We cannot hope to create a platform for the growth that we all want to see if we do not today invest in people's skills, invest in growth sectors and people's capacity to participate and to have jobs and to have businesses in those sectors, invest in infrastructure, both traditional physical infrastructure and digital infrastructure so people could pay things online and so people could make sure that they have um, decent connectivity. How, are we, how do we believe that we can have a platform for growth in the future without investing today in those things. Now, we have to invest sustainab sustainably. We have to borrow sustainably, which is the reason that we spend time and energy, I will tell you, sir, lots of time and lots of energy, because my ministry is the one that leads the negotiations. And I make no apologies for that. Because the work that, that, that my ministry is able to do is the reason that roads can be paved, is the reason that we can start working on mains replacement so that we can mitigate all of this leakage of water. That, that it is a straight line from one to the other, sir. 
our responsibility is to make sure that we are in a position to repay the debt. But you can't be in a position to repay the debt through growth if you don't invest today in the things that are going to give you that growth. So, sir, I am always open to the conversation. I hear the narrative. And it is a, it is a, it is a worthwhile narrative. I think that these are the issues that Barbadians should be discussing. But I wanted to rise to this, sir, to be able to give some context to this conversation and to say that this is a Barbados Labor Party administration, sir, that has tools, that has, because of the way that we've managed the economy and the various sectors, that have options and we are seeking to exercise those options. And so I would want to close by saying that we are in an international economic and financial system that is treacherous. I will tell you, sir, that is treacherous because every day we are managing global minimum tax rate, climate crisis, uh, whether we will be able to, 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 to have um, special set asides for the COVID debt. We are managing all these issues as a small island and, and blacklisting and all of these issues. We're managing all these issues as a small island, but we are doing so putting always, always putting first the people of Barbados and their interests. And with that, sir, I'm obliged to you. I remember Christchurch Essential. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Honorable Member for St. Michael West <laughs> expressed a view that he did not have the confidence in Barbados, or at least that's how he interpreted his statement, that he did not have the confidence in Barbados to be able to recover as quickly as he would like. Uh, on, uh, I remember Mr. Michael Lex. Point of order, <laughs> um, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the honorable member for Christchurch, essential, should not make statements above which he stands worthy. I never said I don't have confidence in Barbados. I have every confidence in Barbados. I am not as persuaded as the Honorable Member is, and that is what I said, and the records will show that, that the operations under the governance of Needham's point, and I go based on what information I have, the operations are such that we can just without caution and prudence, put money into a situation that bails them out. Further, I'm saying in a context where the country itself is struggling with debt, I'm not as fully persuaded in the absence of a significant growth platform that we, the economy, can properly respond to debt servicing going forward. I have every confidence in Barbados, Mr. Speaker, being here a little while longer than the other member for Christchurch East Central. Continue our member Senator. Well, sir, um, I must I must say that was the the honourable member has indicated or clarified for me what his perhaps intent was. The reality is that this government has confidence in Barbados, and I believe ordinary Barbadians have have continued to demonstrate their confidence in us and our ability to be able to manage, sir, the affairs of our country and perhaps I know that he may be getting a little nervous that the, the tenure may be coming to an end but the reality is sir that <laughs> these are <laughs> these are these are just the facts sir in the same way that Needham's Point the all of the almost all of the revenue for Needham's Point and Hilton dropped significantly we must face the reality sir that time is is against us and if we are going to move 
the country for it, then these are critical decisions that have to be made to ensure that we reposition, whether it is Needham's Point, whether it is the airport, whether it is the, the seaport, whether it is any of the, the state-owned enterprises which we have endeavored to reform, sir, because I, I, I say genuinely, sir, to all Barbadians that the efforts to reform government will indeed deliver and accelerate the recovery. And therefore, how quickly we as Barbadians, sir, um, do what we know we must do to ensure that we can extract in a, in a real sense, and, and not just extract, but determine how much value we can generate on a daily basis every single day, sir, across a wide range of sectors, then we will not have done ourselves a, 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 a good service from the perspective of understanding what this pandemic has done to all Barbadians, and therefore to the extent that we who are still working, sir, whether in government or within the, or in the private sector, that we have to carry that load a little um, longer in order to ensure that we can bring back um, things as quickly um, as possible. But I wanted specifically, sir, to just make a few re remarks um, in relation to the Four Seasons matter, um, if you would permit me, sir, since it is, it is not directly related, but since in the context of the Auditor General's report and the Honourable Member raised it here, to just say a few things which, which are uniquely different um, um, in, in, in both perspective as well as, as um, the reality of, of, of where we are. Now, you would be aware, sir, that um, Paradise Beach Limited, Paradise, as we all know it, uh, it was hoarded up down Black Rock for a long time, sir, for a very, very, very long time. And the project in of itself um, was, was um, brought under the, the Four Seasons umbrella and was originally projected to cost about $500 million or so to be able to um, bring that beautiful piece of land and real estate back into production, sir. And we are all familiar with the long-standing issue with Sandals and its acquisition um, around that time. And as you know, sir, the, that particular entity, um, it was supposed to be the hotel, it was supposed to be the villas. It was being financed, sir, by um, Halifax Bank of Scotland, the H boss um, in, in, in the UK, to be able to help build that out um, in terms of the, the, the short-term financing. Um, the crisis in 2008, nine, sir, um, saw that, because Halifax, H boss, sorry, um, Halifax Bank of Scotland was one of the very early banks in the UK, sir, that was significantly impacted by um, the, the, the crisis in 2008-09. Um, if, if memory um, serves me correctly, sir, I believe it was um, then either bought by Lloyds or Royal Bank of Scotland at the time to be able um, to, to, to save it. And therefore, the, the closure of the short-term financing facility in relation to that matter was called in and the extent to which the investment stall um, um, ensued. So effectively, sir, um, the, the, the villa owners determined that they were not going to put any more cash into that um, um, at the time. And effectively, sir, um, all of the, 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 the project closed in early 2009, um, with the developer owing about $28 million in debt served mainly to local suppliers as a, as a result of that. I think up until that point, sir, um, just about $112 million had been um, borrowed from um, H. Boss, whilst there was an investment of $42 million in um, at the time. <sighs> to cut a long story short, sir, <laughs> the last government, <laughs> the last government um, passed in this chamber, well, not this chamber, but, you know, um, in Parliament, um, in, I think, March of 2011, um, a piece of legislation to create something called Clearwater Bay Limited, okay, um, which was as a result of a plan that would see the government guarantee 
a loan from Ansel um, Merchant Bank um, to lend $120 million um, to Paradise Beach Limited, which was the company that was owning the properties at the time um, in relation to that. So the government formed Clearwater Bay to guarantee um, a loan from Ansel, McCall, um, in Trinidad, or, sorry, Ansel Merchant Bank in Trinidad to be able to, to guarantee that um, particular um, that particular facility. Now, the truth is, um, the 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 government, on in terms of the the security, um, had a secondary mortgage debenture and uh, charge over the lands at uh, PBL, and that was to to part PBL meaning uh, Paradise Beach um, Limited, sir. Um, the the venture obviously was the security for the for the for the loan, and that was the arrangement. As um, if you if you check Hansard, um, you would see the details specific of, clear, of the Clear Water Bay Act outlined um, there. So the honourable member um, would would recall as well that P that Paradise Beach Limited subsequently defaulted on the loan. And <laughs> the government, through the central bank at the time, sir, repaid the debt because it had came to, to Parliament in 2011, passed the Clearwater Bay Act, sir, guaranteeing the, the, the loan from Answer Merchant Bank to um, Paradise Beach Limited, and therefore had then to be able to honor that. Now, the truth is, when that happened and, and the central bank paid, uh, through the central bank, sorry, when the government through the central bank um, honored, repaid the debt, and then sought to enforce the charge on the land because obviously the security for the loan was the land. So at that point in time, and this is 2011, so just, just to be clear, at 2011, at that point, what should have happened in the books of government is that you would have had the release of the guarantee because obviously you honored that, and in the books, then the asset comes over to the government of Barbados with respect to that. So you can't have the debt and the asset on your books at the same time. So the reference to that was made in the Auditor General's report to when we came to officer in 2018 <laughs> and looked at everything that was in relation, not just to, to to Clearwater Bay or Paradise Beach Limited. So the reference with respect to the write-off, and I just want for the benefit of all Barbadians, having honored the guarantee which came to this parliament, was passed in this parliament in 2011, having honored the guarantee then, then the monies are no longer there. We have the, the asset then becomes effectively that of the government. And therefore, you can't have both at the same time. It's like having a cake, sir, and eating it. And, and that just doesn't make sense from an accounting perspective, economic perspective, or otherwise. So for the benefit of the honorable member, <laughs> um, and for all um, Barbadians, sir, the, under the last government, the guarantee was paid to, um, ha um, I suppose, Answer Merchant Bank. And then obviously with respect to bringing the ownership because that was part of the security under the arrangement, it meant that the physical space there belonged to the government of Barbados. And therefore, because the physical space, and of course, you being a lawyer, sir, no, no thing, you know, the things always take a little time to, to do, but the reality is when you paid the, the guarantee, then in the essence, the land then becomes free and clear. I think that's the term, sir. Free from encumbrances. Free of encumbrances, sir. You're correct. You're correct. Becomes the 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 property of what would be Clearwater Bay Limited that was formed with respect to that matter. Now, as with everything, sir, it is just consistent with whether it is downgrades or anything else, sir. In terms of the management, the proper accounting for that in on government's balance sheet simply was not done in 2011, it was not done in 2012, it was not done in 2013, sir, it was not done in 2014, 15, 16, 17. It certainly would not have been done in 18 if they had continued, but we came to office, sir, 
and gave a commitment that we would clean up everything in relation to the matter. So the $124 million that is referred to in the Auditor General's report, which has been laid, sir, in this parliament, since 2011 has been paid because there was a guarantee for an act that was passed in this parliament to <laughs> guarantee the 120 odd million with respect to answer merchant bank, sir, that was lent at the time. It was supposed to be lent for 18 months to Paradise um, Beach Limited. And any Barbadian, sir, probably could pass down Black Rock now because some of the hoarding dropped down. And you could see all, every, everyone in, 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 in this country can see exactly what, what took place down there. Now, I will, that is all I will, I will um, indicate to the chamber at this time in relation to that because the, this government has been working to be able to ensure, as I, as I indicated earlier, that we can bring a measure of respectability back to, to a process. Um, we were reasonably close, but COVID intervened and, and, and put things on a little pause. But we are confident that we will be able to rescue that specific um, project and the investment um, once we're able to, to, to get past this very um, challenging time with respect to, to COVID. There, there are a number of other um, threads to the, the development of, 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 or the evolution, I should say, of this specific transaction. And therefore, whilst I know that there's been a lot of public um, discourse around this matter, and I did give a commitment to, to um, one of the, the radio hosts to, to come back and give some information, I felt it was important for me to raise it here first, sir, in Parliament, since it originated here <laughs> with respect to the passing of the Clearwater Bay Act to guarantee the loan. That I just take the I took the opportunity to remind the honourable member that uh, a careful review of Hansard will, will will demonstrate such, and therefore the accounting for what should have happened um, under the last government did not take place as it should have, and therefore in 2018-19 fiscal year when we came to office under the context of the debt restructuring, since we this that's the essence of the bill here, sir. When we looked at all of government's um, liabilities and what we had on our books, we determined that obviously this, 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 this particular um, sum of money that we were effectively still guaranteeing, even though we'd already paid, and, and in the minds of, of whoever was, was responsible for, for the accounting, simply was not done. And we took the opportunity then, sir, to do that which should have been done since 2011, in 2012, 13, all the way through, sir, which under normal circumstances, sir, even if you don't do it all in one, in one go, you will do it over the course of a, of a few years from an accounting perspective to be able to, to, to effect it. So I, do, I give the, not just the chamber, but certainly the country, sir, that this government, this government had absolutely no um, <laughs> involvement with for the Four Seasons matter. They had no involvement with respect to the paying of the money, sir, um, to guarantee the loan. All we did, sir, is acknowledge the fact that the money was paid by the last government, that the land that secured the, that was, a, um, that was used as, as the security, that it is now in effect in the ownership of Clearwater Bay, and therefore, Acknowledging that is what the write down effectively meant. So I want to, I, I hope that matter is uh, made clear for the honorable member and for those persons who um, may have had some queries or questions around where um, the money has gone. Um, in relation to, to, to the bill, sir, I, I, uh, let me thank the honorable member for St. Michael um, South Central. Um, as always, for making it absolutely clear, sir, that what Barbados have been able, what we have been able to achieve as a country, sir, in 
being able to raise finance, but, re but raise it responsibly, sir. Raise it responsibly in the context of being able to successfully execute a very ambitious uh, Barbados Economic Recovery Transformation Program. Um, I know that for some, every time the IMF announces that we've passed a review, it, it, it creates a little bit of angst because for them, somehow or the other, they want to see the country fail, but we came to, to government to get rid of failure and to make sure that we can focus on doing that which will help deliver better for all of our people, sir. Um, but the reality is we continue to work very hard. It is not easy by any stretch of imagination. Every member in here, bar one perhaps, understands that fully, <laughs> the amount of work that is required to be able to, to see that. But we don't say that lightly, sir, because when the Prime Minister literally says many hands make light work, that is exactly what she means. And we have worked tirelessly, sir, to bring this country back from what was almost certain economic ruin to, to a place where multilateral agencies can say to the world, and as, as the member for St. Michael South Central said, that when we give them some money, we are confident that we will say it back because this government, sir, has been able to turn the fortunes of this country around, and even in the middle of a COVID pandemic, be able to have the confidence of agencies to, to, to say that we believe in Barbados, just as the people of Barbados believes in itself. Now, sir, this is not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. Because we don't know what is out there, but we, are, we have always prided, um, or prided ourselves, sir, with respect to being able to ensure that we will face whatever confronts us, sir, and we will fix it. And notwithstanding the fact that the economy has taken a, a severe lash, sir, with respect to not just the GDP, but equity, sir, with respect to the revenue, that the financing that we've been able to raise at 1%, sir, is the cheapest financing uh, unless we were in, in, if we were a graduated country, sir, in the context of the World Bank slash IMF in that context, um, we would be, the, the, the only financing available is that which would be available to countries like St. Vincent, for example, um, at 0% in special um, conditions, conditional access with respect to natural disasters and those types of things. So the reality is that the, the, the responsible nature within which we have been responding to the pandemic by engaging the international community is important to understand because without that support at this time, many of the very uh, public goods and services that we are continue to provide to the public, um, the pressure will be even more immense, sir, with respect to being able to, to provide. And we have embarked on ensuring that we can provide a level of social protection over and above which we would normally do within the context of the welfare department and the other social service um, um, agencies. And all of that costs money, and, and I know that there has been some public debate about this tax and the next tax and all of these kinds of things. But the reality is Barbados didn't arrive at this position overnight. We didn't have 21, we didn't build 21 secondary schools and, and 60 or 80 odd primary schools last year. We didn't put in all the polyclinics and all of the roads, all weren't built at the same time, sir. And therefore, to the extent that there is the accumulation of debt, that is the accumulation of the investment, whether social or private investment in the country, that the reality is um, the tax policy that is associated with one, sir, not just um, debt service, but that debt service, sir, um, has, has, well, is, is predicated on the fact that we have committed ourselves, sir, to a, a public policy stance where we are providing, on, um, on the one hand, education and healthcare free at the, at the point of delivery for all Barbadians, that we have a range of collective services, including, sir, the police, the fire service, to some extent, I suppose, the prison service, um, <laughs> and the, those, those services that none of us can exempt ourselves from, but require 
financing, sir, and therefore, once you may determine how you may, how you can educate yourself or your children, or perhaps whether you engage yourself, um, avail yourself, sorry, of any of the public health um, institutions, at the end of the day, sir, those collective services you can't opt out of, and therefore the context within which um, we seek to ensure that we can lift those up um, who are most vulnerable in, in our society. We live in a social democracy, and I am proud to be a part of a party that, is, that, that understands the commitment to that social development very, very, very clearly, and therefore um, any discussion surrounding um, tax reform, tax policy, which we have always done, is predicated, sir, on how do we deliver those suite of, of public policies. That means that ordinary, our constituents, sir, whether in Kew Road, sir, or in Water, or in Rose Hill, um, whether in Parkinson Field, in, in, in Jurich, Parish Land, Haynesville, Westbury Road, sir, um, Rice's, any part of Barbados, sir, Deacon's Road, Clinks, Clinkets, in St. Lucie. The reality is, sir, I said Jurich, Redmond Village. <laughs> but the point is, sir, that, that wherever Barbados come from, they can avail themselves of all of these services that we provide as, as a country. And we have a responsibility, sir, to understand that when we have benefited from all that Barbados can offer, that we understand that there's a perspective that the rest is not yet done. And therefore, we must continue to invest in our people and therefore our tax structures and how, we, and how those taxes are expended and that whilst you can't build every institution or every physical thing at the same time, that over a period of your development, that your debt will accumulate. And that as your debt accumulates, it has to be extinguished in order to do new, new, new development. The only way that you can do that is when people have confidence in you, sir, that they will lend you the money. And because of COVID, we've had to, 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 to focus a lot on the budget support that's required. But the reality is, sir, that the long-term trajectory of this country has been built in, in, in social capital, which is our people. And therefore, that's why I indicated earlier that it is incumbent upon all of us who continue to work even in, in, in a very strained um, set of circumstances as COVID has presented, that it allows us now to be able to understand that we must do a little more heavy lifting and make sure that the decisions that we take and that the work that we execute, that we do so as quickly as possible so that we can get the recovery um, accelerated as, 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 as time um, progresses. This is a very important um, subject matter, sir. And it would be, it, it really would be remiss of me if I didn't raise those um, few issues um, earlier because I felt it was important, sir, that not just for the record, because it's not just for the record, but to allow Barbados to appreciate that there's good debt and there's bad debt. And that what we have been able to do in the context of a work program is that we have taken on debt as required. And certainly in the context of COVID, we've taken on debt because we had no choice, because it was either to close the gap with respect to financing or cut the budget, sir, by almost $600 million. And cutting the budget in the middle of, of <laughs> a global pandemic, sir, was, was, was never going to be a, a, it was a non-starter. And therefore, the, the way that we've chosen to finance that gap and therefore, I urge, as I always do, sir, all Barbadians, as we have reopened, sir, that in order to remain open, we've got to continue to follow the protocols so that we don't have this stop and start, stop and start thing with the economy, so that we can employ as many people as possible, so that the, the recovery can accelerate. We can have more Barbadians going back to work, and that we can welcome back visitors to Barbados for the same needless point and Hilton, sir, to be able to accommodate so that we can see some normalization of activity and that the concerns which legitimately raised, sir, about questions of debt legitimately raised, that people will feel much more assured that with the recovery and the, the impetus with respect to changes and reforms that are to be gone through, that once executed, 
that we will, we will know that we are not just in a position fiscally, but that the economy will be able to um, accommodate in full um, once recovered to be able to accommodate the debt service. And so, sir, um, with those few words, I beg to move um, that this bill be read a second time. Question is that the aforementioned bill be read a second time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that you do not leave the chair and the House Resolve itself in committee for a further consideration of this bill. The question is that the Speaker do not leave the chair and the House Resolve itself into committee for further consideration of this bill. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. This house is now in committee. Clause one. <laughs> Madam Chair, beg to move that clause one stand part. Question is that clause one stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Clause two. Madam Chair, beg to move that clause two stand part. Question is that clause two stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. He thinks the ayes have it. Clause three. Madam Chair, beg to move that clause three stand part. Question is that clause three stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Clause four. Madam Chair, I beg to move that clause four stand part. Question is that clause four stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Clause five. Madam, Madam Chair, I beg to move that clause five stand part. Question is that clause five stand part. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Schedule. Madam Chair, I beg to move that the schedule be the schedule to the bill. Question is that the schedule be the schedule to the bill. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. He thinks the ayes have it. Report. Madam Chair, I beg to move that you do not report his honor the speaker the passing of one bill in committee. The question is that I do not report his honor the speaker the passing of one bill in committee. All honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. He thinks the ayes have it. The chairman of committees has reported in the passing of one bill in committee. One more. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that this bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. Me think the ayes have it. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that this bill be now passed and cited as the Needham's Point Holdings Limited Exchange and Issue of Bonds Act 2021. The question is that this bill be passed and so cited. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. This bill is passed and so cited. Order number six, sir. In the name of the Honorable Minister of Home Affairs, Information and Public Affairs, to move the second reading of the Remote Employment Amendment Bill 2021. Honorary Member Christchurch East. Mr. Speaker, I rise to speak on what has been one of the success stories coming out of COVID and to say that it was so nice, sir, we have to do it twice. Sir, <laughs> when COVID, not COVID, not COVID, sir, not COVID. When COVID started to impact the globe, sir, and came home to us in Barbados, we realized the fragility of a tourism-based economy. And 
at one point in time, sir, we were staring oblivion in the face. Barbados did not know what to do or where the next dollar was going to come from. And one of the measures that was put in place early o'clock, sir, was the concept of the welcome stamp. If we are not going to get the short-term tourists, and we're not going to get the longer-term tourists, so then we need to actually spread our definition of what tourism is and expand our concept of what we believe tourism to be, to include the concept of somebody who's here for a longer time than six months, which is pretty much a long-stay visitor for Barbados. And as we watched the rest of the world pretty much crumble under the weight of COVID, and we watched developed countries and some of our source markets closing down because they were unable to manage the impacts of COVID and Barbados was managing quite well, sir, and we continue to manage quite well. So before you go any further, I would like to once again congratulate, sir, the Minister of Health, the COVID subcommittee, and all of those who are concerned and work with the health services in Barbados for what has been an excellent management of the response to COVID in Barbados, sir. It may shock a lot of us because we're accustomed to saying things, sir, and I hate to hear it. I hate to hear she did well for Beijing. Mm -hmm. Or this person accomplished something, and that's good for a Beijing, as if we revel in mediocrity. But, sir, when you examine the statistics and the actual empirical results, one would realize that Barbados is among the countries in the entire world that is best managing our response to COVID and all the complications that come with that. So, sir, based on the fact that at the time our rate was low, we were very slow in the grand scheme of things to record our first COVID case. And other persons who were in developed countries, which form our source market, were looking, trying to figure out how can they escape their countries and escape the rising, thank you, and escape the rising rates of COVID in their own countries, sir. And they started to turn their eyes to Barbados. We started getting inquiries as, you know, what can happen? As I said, sir, we have certain immigration requirements. We have certain immigration statuses, but none of which contemplated a situation like this where you have effectively a COVID refugee, somebody fleeing their country to come to a safer country where they can operate and do their business from there. Technological advances, sir, advances made by the government in facilitating online um, business played a large part in this. And a lot of persons turned their eyes towards Barbados as a safe haven to go with their families and spend a year while they try to ride out the COVID in Barbados and not in their own country because they felt safer here. And that goes a lot, sir, towards the perception of Barbados internationally. We were among the first countries to announce a program for a live and work in what is traditionally a tourist des destination. From the time we announced it, sir, you saw others fall in pattern. And persons tried to back raise us and drop the fees below what it was that we had. But effectively, Barbados is one of the pioneers in the world in this. And this showed a lot of forward thinking, sir, on behalf of, it was the Prime Minister's baby initially, but it was ably supported, sir, by the Immigration Department and the Ministry of Tourism. All of Barbados pitched in to try to help throw Barbados a lifeline until the tourists can come back as we're accustomed to. Sir, this fully online application initiative commenced on the 18th of July, 2020. And I just want to give a synopsis, sir, of some of the statistical data and the benefits derived under the 12 month what I will call the welcome stamp. Everybody knows, it has a, a more complicated name, but everybody knows it as the welcome stamp. Sir, the United Nations framework for the immediate socio-economic response to the COVID-19 crisis noted at the time that without urgent socio-economic responses, global suffering will escalate, jeopardizing livelihoods for years to come. And as a small tourism dependent economy, sir, we saw a significant reduction in our economic activity. Other persons today have spoken from the floor of parliament about the various impacts on our economic activity occasion by 
COVID, sir, but we experienced a significant reduction in our activity. However, we have successfully implemented restrictions, sir, to stop the local transmission of COVID in Barbados. And as such, we've been able to promote Barbados as a safe, secure, and beloved destination to work from under the Remote Employment Act 2020. The act, sir, became effective on the 22nd of July 2020, as I said, and provided for non-nationals who are not citizens of Barbados to come to Barbados and to be able to work from Barbados for 12 months by obtaining a welcome stamp. The initial fees, sir, that were set were $4,000 for an individual or $6,000 for a family. That's Barbados $4,000 for an individual and Barbados $6,000 for a family. And everybody pitched in with this because it's, it's not just an immigration initiative, it's not just a tourism initiative, but we had to liaise with education to ensure that the persons coming here will be able to place the children in schools. We had to ensure sir, people were inquiring about ability to join clubs when they're here, for the children to do dancing, all the activities that they might be accustomed to doing. They wanted to just pick their families up and drop their families into a situation where they can continue as normal as possible, as normally as possible, sir, but not in their own country. So things, sir, like liaising with the telecoms com companies to make sure that our internet was stable. Things like liaising with hotels and guest houses to make sure that they had the fastest possible internet, that everything was upgraded very, very quickly to ensure that a lot of our processes, immigration and otherwise, sir, were upgraded very quickly to make this process as seamless and as painless as possible. Sir, people have for years complained about immigration. Immigration is that department. I don't know how you keep ending up with these departments, sir, but immigration was that department. No, no. I say that because I'm going to say something very positive. Immigration was that department that everybody had a complaint about. The immigration department, sir, has undergone a transformation. Most of the feedback I'm getting in relation to immigration, sir, is exceedingly positive with respect to response times for queries, with respect to processing applications. Sir, it is well known now that you can get your passport done online and your passport delivered to your house, sir. Right? All of these we have done not just to make life easy for those persons coming in under the welcome stamp, but to make life easy for Barbadians. So we had two options with COVID, sir. We had the option of capitulating and saying, woe is me, as we lay down and wait for it to take over our country. Or we had the option of saying, there are a lot of things that we needed to do, and now is the chance to do it. Now is the time to bring Barbados up to scratch as a leader in the world and an easy place to do business. It may surprise people, to, sir, to learn that the turnaround time for a welcome stamp application is five days. Anybody making an application for welcome stamp, sir, should be able to get their approval once all their documents are in order within five days. And I know it's been working, sir, because all of the applications eventually have to get the assent of the minister, and in particular the refusals. So. We see them all, and we see the speed at which they are be, they're being processed, sir. Um, Barbadians initially were concerned about persons becoming a charge on the state, or people looking to come to Barbados as an excuse to avail themselves of social um, security measures. There was a great concern as to when these people come here, if they got sick, then what would happen? So bearing in mind all of those, sir, Protocols were put in place and strict requirements were made to effectively filter out persons looking to take advantage of a situation. So a person could avail themselves of a welcome stamp, sir, if they could prove an annual income of over $100,000. And they can prove that the income is generated outside of Barbados. So we want people coming here to work, but they must not be coming here to take Beijing jobs. They must, their business and their income must be generated from outside of Barbados. And sir, and they also had to prove that they were the holder of a valid health insurance policy for the period for which they were in Barbados. So if the persons became ill, it's not a, a matter of the state paying for them and losing out. They must be able to pay for themselves or have insurance coverage. So all of these were put in place sir, before somebody was approved for a welcome stamp. So a lot of obligations were put on us to make sure we weeded out certain people 
And what I would tell you, sir, it has been interesting to see who has been trying to come to Barbados. So, you would, we've had some people, sir, we run checks on every single person. So every person seeking to come to Barbados had to go through severe and stringent JRCC checks. If there was the slightest thing about them, sir, it was further investigated and then kicked back up to the minister for a final refusal in most cases. Because the immigration was so strict in the processing of welcome stamps, sir, that I have not had occasion to override their decision to approve anybody. At some points in time, so I thought that they were being a little bit too strict at times, but that is their job. Their job was to protect Barbados and make sure we screened who was coming in. Sir, we had people who had been flagged for fraud. We had people who had done many years in other countries for serious crimes. We had people who changed their name, changed their passport. Sir, some of the pictures that came to me of persons applying for welcome stand had them bare back. I mean, the application comes to me and I'm seeing somebody without their shirt posing for the picture. Now, a lot of persons applied, sir. A lot of persons. We weeded out those and this is to protect Barbados and our way of life. We want to have you, but we want to have you in a way that we are sure that we can control and we are sure you will not cause a problem later because at the end of the day, is about protection of Barbadians first and foremost. Sir, I want at this point in time to thank the Welcome Stamp team. I am very pleased with the Immigration Department and the recent performance of the Immigration Department. Periodically you will get a complaint, but as opposed to every time somebody calls you and mentions immigration, you roll your eyes, the complaints are maybe one in 20, and there are things that are easily rectified. Sir, I, I know that we shouldn't call names, but I'm gonna crave your leave, sir, because it's for a good thing. The welcome stamp team, sir, ably led by Miss Margaret Innes, who's the Deputy Chief Immigration Officer. Her second in command, sir, is Miss Ingrid Jones, who's a senior immigration officer. The team also is a team that comprises Keisha Haynes, Natisha Comabach, Jason Allen, and Amory Ward, who's a statistics and analytics. So when I met with them in the early days, they were operating out of one room at the Grant Adams International Airport. People were actually using their own cell phones to contact persons to touch base with them. They answered all queries about Barbados. All queries. They chased down people. We had a lot of initial interest, sir, but sometimes if you don't actually follow these things through, they never um, amount to anything. They never bear fruit. And you had a group of individuals who didn't just process applications, they chased the money down. Because at the end of the day, this was something aimed at bringing revenue into Barbados. I was there, sir, with them as they called and called and called to reach people. We went through trying to use, what's that thing that you're you buying? Magic Jack. Sir, we, we, we use WhatsApp calls, we try to do it over the internet, and I was, um, if I could give each of them a medal, sir, believe me, the ceremony will be going on right now. Pin, pin, pin. It was amazing the effort that this team put into that, and I want to commend the Welcome Stamp team because they took service and customer service in Barbados to a new level. The rest of Barbados could watch them and take the example from them. And I also want to commend the chief immigration officer because he allowed them to manage the process. And there will come a time, sir, when we, we debate a more substantive bill, when I can have my full say on immigration. I thank a lot more people, but suffice it to say that the immigration department, sir, is assisting in the salvation of Barbados and ably so. Sir, to date, Approximately 109 nationalities have expressed interest in working remotely from Barbados, sir. The UK and Canada represent 70% of the total applications. Sir, about 2,810 applications were received and 1,891 were approved. Um, this represents 3,303 persons overall. Sir, 
699 families have been approved and the sum of revenue collected to date is four million and thirty four thousand dollars sir four million and thirty four thousand dollars and this is simply in the fees but the extent or the impact on the economy of Barbados provided by the welcome stamp is not limited to the fees so you would hear that the fees made four million odd dollars but it is not just the fees that were paid these people became 12 month tourists in Barbados doing all of the things that tourists did they're the ones doing the water sports sir they're the ones eating out in the restaurants when nobody else was there they're the ones sending the children to the private schools and, and putting money into the economy sir they're the, they're buying groceries they're the ones who are renting the villas that nobody else was renting and providing income to a lot of those businesses that were on the verge of clo closing that catered to tourism so we had sir over 1200 one-year tourists in Barbados and what is impactful sir what is impactful is that almost all of them wanted to renew their welcome stamp and stay on for another year uh, yeah that's something sir there's something called brand Barbados the idea of dreaming big living different staying safe and secure and united in Barbados sir pardon sir one person actually wrote in and complimented us at their found a rheumatologist in Bar I didn't even know sir there was something called a rheumatologist but this person had been suffering for quite some time came to Barbados not expecting to find a rheumatologist found a rheumatologist here and no, does not want to leave Barbados. But the, the point is, sir, it was, it was an initiative to save our economy. And what it turned into, sir, is an inspiration for a new tourism product. The tourism product that says it can be done better here. Anything that you have to do, you can do from here. Come to Barbados. You don't have to come here for a couple of days and leave. Bring your family. Enjoy the island life. Enjoy the way that we live. Don't lose out on your business because all you in the States and all you in Canada and all you in, in the UK are working from home anywhere. Home could be Barbados. So this welcome stamp initiative, sir, is what I would call an amazing success story. Just some ideas, sir, of the, the, the benefits for Barbados. The importation of highly skilled professionals who can bring across fertilization of skills and ideas. Individuals who may help position the country's human capital on the cutting edge of technological development. Persons who add significantly to the value and quality of the human, human capital in Barbados. Skilled professionals who have skill sets that we don't actually have here. And some persons, sir, brought, there are a lot of IT people in Barbados. There are a lot of tech people in Barbados right now, sir, who are bringing skills to Barbados that we actually don't have. So the opportunity now exists for us to try to keep those people here to train Bajans in emerging and evolving skill sets that we do not have any concept of in Barbados. So it's a cross-fertilization, sir, of, of opportunities. It's a cross-fertilization of technologies. It's a cross-fertilization, sir, of economies. Um, We did a survey, sir. Well, not we. The BTMA did a survey among the welcome stampers on the island. And the vast majority of them, when asked to tick boxes, ticked the box that suggested that the process for obtaining the welcome stamp was flawless, sir. Approximately 76% of the welcome stampers were first-time visitors to Barbados. And 96% of the overall persons who participated in the survey described the application process as easy and user friendly the real estate agents are happy sir because persons are buying properties in Barbados a number of the welcome stampers not satisfied with renting actually purchase properties in Barbados so we are seeing the benefits of this over and over but I, I said I was gonna be brief sir so I will just say when we brought this into play it was intended to provide a haven for persons for a year 
we did not at the time, sir, contemplate the success of the program. Though we wished for it, we did not contemplate the success for the program and the overwhelming response of persons who actually wanted to stay on in Barbados. The act as currently drafted has no provision for renewal. So that is what we seek to do here today. That, that's the basic thing we're here to do today, sir. We're seeking to add a provision that allows for the renewal of the welcome stamp for another 12 months. The, I had given you fees before, sir. Um, we appreciate that the persons here have already made a sacrifice, already contributing. So anybody who is trying to renew their welcome stamp will do so at 75% of what the original cost was. So in the, in, in the case of an individual, you can renew it for $3,000. In the case of a family, $4,500. And if somebody is applying for the first time, the original fees, fees sir, will, will obtain. So in a nutshell, that's what it is, sir. We have to recognize when something is good. I have not heard of any downside to the welcome stamp. I have instead, sir, heard only completely positive things. And as a government, sir, we are happy. There's not one person who's raised an objection, sir, for the renewal of the welcome stamp so that we can continue what is a widely successful program what has received international publicity and acclaim for Barbados, and what is an example, sir, of a government department or a series of government departments all working together harmoniously to produce a world-class, world-leading, world-beating product in the Barbados Welcome Stamp, sir. So we're looking to renew it for at least another 12 years, and who knows, sir? Who, who knows? Oh, sorry, another 12, you see, sir? I'm thinking ahead of all of the possibilities for Barbados, but we're looking to renew it for another 12 months, sir. And I look forward to us reaping the benefits of it because, quite frankly, if we boil it down to as simple as we get, the welcome stamp, sir, sir, save Barbados, along with the management of the government in the response to COVID. Sir, with those few words, I beg to move it as we read a second thing. Honorable Lady Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, when this, the original legislation being amended today was brought here, um, I supported it, but I expressed and relatively strongly two concerns. Um, I say that to suggest that I am not standing to speak against the intention or notion of renewal being attached to the legislation by way of this amendment. But I did, have some, I did have some concerns expressed at the time with reference to the background checks, the level and inadequacy of background checks being made with reference to persons who potentially would have, have applied to benefit from this access for remote work in Barbados, that was one um, concern. I don't know that that concern has been in, entirely um, allayed insofar as that goes. The other concern I had at the time, one I still do, has to do with that part of the legislation that spoke to relationship construct unfamiliar to us. And um, I have a feeling, Mr. Speaker, in the minds of the majority of Barbadians, uh, still one undesirable as a construct of family uh, among us. Those were the two concerns I, I had then. In terms of the immediate measure before us, I asked some questions, as usual, um, to which I was hoping I could get some answers, if not today, perhaps uh, at some later date. The intention, obviously, of the legislation that provides for access to the opportunity of remote work in Barbados is intended to benefit uh, Barbadians broadly and significantly uh, so. And a metric for me would be the contribution that the program thus far after a year, approximately, has made to the contribution it has made, economic contribution or financial contribution it has made to various sectors in Barbados. Obviously, the accommodation sector is a principal one. 
um, a primary one. Auto rentals, these are things which are fairly easy to measure. There are some other things which you may not be so, uh, may not be so capable of measuring. A guy goes to the supermarket, you see a face, you see a figure. You do not necessarily know that he's in your supermarket as a person who is here under the welcome stamp program. But certainly auto rentals uh, is something that you can check. The accommodation sector, the Honorable Minister mentioned um, the occupancy with respect to villas, et cetera, apartments. That is something you can check. So what is the, que what is the contribution if there's any measure in place, any metric in place to seek to measure the contribution to the economy in specific terms rather than an estimate given in general terms. The minister did respond to this question, obviously before I had the privilege of raising it, but the numbers who have applied, the numbers who have been approved, and um, I commend the effort to have 2,800 persons express an interest, 1,891, I think it was, I think I caught that figure, um, approvals. Now, I'm not too sure. The minister gave us some broad areas of, of skills from which the country over time might benefit because of the presence of these people. But my question really, more specifically, is the types of work that people are coming to do. You know, they're, they're working remotely, but in what areas of endeavor, in what areas of enterprise are these people um, working? What are the work types? therefore, that we are attracting to Barbados. Now, the minister said that they've been very careful in screening those who have applied, and he was a bit taken aback by the um, <laughs> seeming uh, profiles and characters of some who had, in fact, applied. My question really is, have we, have, have we had any instances of revocation of the permits issued to people to come? Have we had a, a need to revoke um, permits issued to anybody under the Welcome Start, Start Program? And if there have been recommend revocations, if there have been revocations, what would have been the causes um, associated with those acts on the part of the immigration or the minister himself in revoking um, permission given for access to do uh, remote, remote work in Barbados. People, of course, would have come here um, with families. I think we heard about 600 something families. Um, that means children, that implies school opportunity or the need to have people uh, in the, into the um, educational institutions in Barbados, largely so I imagine the private education institutions of Barbados, what are the types of fees um, being applied for such access into the Barbados um, school system? Um, again, the level of employment generated among Barbados, I think particularly so for persons who work in the dom domestic context, maids, etc. cetera, um, what is the impact it is having upon that, char that category of worker in Barbados. Is there an intention on the part of government, and I thought perhaps it was a little bit of a Freudian slip, is there any intention on the part of government to graduate these persons from this special work permit status to permanent status over time in Barbados? I know there's a regular status, uh, if you call it status, um, the regular classification of people who come to work here on the permit. Um, they can reside and work here, um, I think, over time, uh, in periods of, in three year periods, it used to be. And then at some stage, they can move on to a more permanent resident status, whether it's immigrant status, permanent residence, ultimately citizenship. It's a graduated process. Is there any plan on the part of government to have these people here who are on the remote work uh, arrangements? graduated through process to a permanent status in Barbados. Because the minister is talking about the passing of skills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
Now, one unpleasant note that I must sound or raise, and it's been in public media, I hope it's accurate, whether it's accurately reported or not. I, I, I can't speak to that, but I, I imagine that it is. But we've had one fairly high profile case of arrests with reference to a visitor in Barbados who stays here under um, certain seeming circumstances. Does this individual have anything to do with the remote access um, welcome stamp program, um, as it is more properly called? Um, happens. Uh, it could happen anywhere. It's just a matter of public information. I know that these are matters that fall under the purview of the law and the system of justice, and we have to be cautious and limited in what can be said. But is that high-profile individual um, in any way connected with the Welcome Start program? If he is not, I would urge the minister to very quickly dismiss that view from the minds of people. Thank you, sir. I am over to St. GM South. Thank you very much, sir. I thank you for the opportunity to speak on this occasion with the Remote Employment Bill. And I truly congratulate my colleague, the Honorable Member for Christchurch East, on the success of this particular project. And in particular, I would want to congratulate his team. Hearty congratulations for the excellent work in processing our welcome stamp guests. So the Ministry of Home Affairs through immigration has done their part. Ministry of Tourism in taking the project, developing and marketing it, they have done their part. It is now for the rest of us as Barbadians to do our part to make this project a continued success. And by that, sir, I mean that when we have the digital nomads around us who've come now to live with us, they haven't come to visit for a week or two weeks or a month, but they've committed to make Barbados their second home and to operate digitally from our shores and to come and be a part of our community. What that requires of us is that as Barbadians, we must make them very welcome. We must make them feel at home in our space, that we are happy and delighted for the opportunity to share a space with them. Now, sir, you know that old time Bajan saying, come see me and come live with me is two different things. That is why I want to urge Barbadians that we must put our best foot forward, our best behavior forward, both for the sake of our own society and the comfort of our own interactions with each other, and to include in our society the visitors who have come to share our island home and to make them feel welcome in our society and in our midst. But I feel that there are a set of opportunities here, and the Honorable Member for Christchurch East started mentioning some of the things that we need to do. And for me, I would love to see that we look carefully at this group to understand what are the goods and services that they particularly need, that they have been accustomed to, that would be important for our convenience to continue their lives here. And that we very creatively add a special Bajan flavor, a Bajan touch to those services, to those products. If we can do that and introduce them to things Bajan so that they begin to acquire a taste for our products and services we then would have created for ourselves a team of commercial diplomats who will be speaking well of Barbados every day, who will be sharing with others, their friends, their work colleagues, their experiences here in Barbados and promoting the brand and image of Barbados. We must not miss this opportunity. We must not let it lapse for failure to plan for it 
to create it, to deliberately promote it. So we need a range of world-class services with a Bajan flavor. Now, how are we going to be able to do that? It is not just that we need a program designed to come up with it, but we need the average Barbadian to critically examine this as an opportunity for them to build a path to build an opportunity for earning income for themselves and for their families and to be able to do it at a global level of excellence. And therefore, I want to strongly recommend to Barbadians that they participate in the National Transformation Initiative, which is designed specifically to help Barbadians attain a level of service and performance excellence that will allow us to be highly skilled but deliver service with impeccable, impeccable performance. Now, sir, one of the things that has always helped Barbados despite our challenges in the past with service, despite our challenges in the past with efficiency, despite our challenges with being able to understand the importance of time and timeliness, one of the things that Barbadians have always been good at is connecting to people from the heart. This is what has given Barbados one of the highest repeat guest rates in the Caribbean, and indeed one of the highest repeat guest rates in the world. We have often celebrated our visitors who come for 25 visits, or have been here for 20 something years. Some came when they were children, and now they are old and they bring their grandchildren and their children with them. And Barbados is their home. These are people who have money, sir. These are people who can go and visit and live any part of the world. But wherever they go to experience other cultures, they make Barbados that second home. I am saying that we have in our midst a group of people that if we can engage them from the heart, that these are the people who are going to help Barbados to form a new generation of visitors, which we so urgently need. And we do. One of the things when you look at the profile of the Barbados tourism product is that our visitors have been getting older and older as the time has gone by. And therefore, we have not been as successful in attracting a younger visitor to be able to replenish that stock of visitors who would have kept Barbados afloat for many years. So here now is another opportunity for us to attract a younger generation of visitor who can attract their friends and their work colleagues who though they may not come on a welcome stamp program will certainly want to come on holiday in an island that has impressed their colleagues so much. And so if we want to be able to capture this younger generation, our tourism planners, of course, will be busy at work looking at what are some of the services and activities, et cetera, that need to be put in place to be able to attract and hold a younger visitor. But sir, it provides another opportunity that I think we need to pay some attention to. And I think that our culinary skills have been underexploited. Part of my life, sir, has been traveling throughout the region and indeed various parts of the world working. And uh, I've always had the opportunity to cross compare Barbados with a number of other places that I have visited. And let me reassure everyone, the best ice cream to be found in the world is here in Barbados. Beja made. I can tell you that. I now understand why there's so much resistance to keeping it out of many markets because when I've tasted what others have to offer, it cannot match our Beja ice cream. But sir, we need to be able to develop a set of culinary dishes. Take them to a new level. We don't do enough of it 
in Turks and Caicos and Cayman Islands, they take local foods and they gourmandize them. They raise them to a gourmet level. They serve them attractively. And they encourage visitors to taste our local foods packaged in very pleasing arrangements. And this is needed. The benefit to Barbados is this. If we can attractively package our local dishes, then we can generate manufacturing to be able to provide an opportunity where we can take those foods and begin to market them across the world so that now it is not only our diaspora that have left our shores who would want to eat those foods, but the Barbadians that we have created in the digital nomad, the ones who become Bajan by heart, to get them to be able to promote these across the world. And so we can build some manufacturing coming out of this that will allow us to be able to take Barbadian foods and really take them to a global level. The Italians did it with pizza. Very simple, very easy. Campbell's did it with soup. But I think that we stand a very good chance if there is a focus in our food technology divisions, in our restaurants, that we can create dishes that have potential for trade. And so I believe that this wonderful little group can really act as a catalyst to a number of things that can help us to restore the fortunes of Barbados and take the image of Barbados far and near and give us a fighting chance to build a life here on our island home for every single Barbadian, born by nature or adopted by heart. And so, sir, I want to offer my congratulations again. Please convey them to your agency. And I want to challenge every Barbadian, let us do our part. Keep our country clean, maintain our protocols, make people welcome, grab them by the heart, and let us take Barbados forward. I'm obliged to you, Mr. Speaker. I remember pressures, please. Sir, my heart almost missed a beat just now. I thought the honorable member was saying grab them by the parts, sir, but she said by the part. <laughs> sir, I just want to touch on a few things raised by the honorable member for St. Michael West. So it, it has been a rough day, so a little bit of levity is what is needed sometimes. Sir, I just want to assure the Honorable Member there's some things that he has asked and I will check up on. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I do not think anyone has had their welcome stamp revoked. And that is not an indication of laxity on our part is an indication of the exceedingly stringent security checks up front. The security checks were front-loaded, sir. So it is easier to come to Barbados as a tourist than it was to come to Barbados under a welcome stamp. So some of the things that may have plagued you in your past, that we would not deny you entry to Barbados on as a visitor, those things would have operated against you as someone on the welcome stamp. The other thing as well, um, the, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, sir, had queried what is it, whether the government's intention was to absorb these people into Barbados or to avail them of any immigration opportunities. There's not been a policy decision on that, sir, but quite frankly, one of the criteria for your coming to Barbados was that you had to establish that you were earning an income of in excess of $100,000 overseas. So if you're somebody who is in that bracket and you were looking to make Barbados your home in the normal scheme of things, you would be somebody that we would welcome. You would be somebody who has something to offer. In many instances, the persons who are here, to answer another question of the leader of opposition, are persons who operate in the cyberspace um, sphere. So persons who have web-based businesses, we have a lot of people who um, have companies on the net and whether they do 
things, sort of like Amazon buying and selling on the net, or businesses that they can, or they're entrepreneurs, sir, and they don't actually need to be there, persons in manufacturing processes. We have a number of people, sir, from finance, and we have a lot of IT people as well. So all of the persons who are here are bringing skill sets, many of which don't actually fully exist in Barbados, but none of which are pointing towards taking a local job. A number of the persons who actually applied, and we turned down, I'm gonna get the exact figure for the leader of the opposition, uh, and perhaps it's, it'd probably be instructive for us to do a full report on it and share it with the public and with the press. But anybody who there was a sniff that the person was coming here looking for a job, got denied. If there was even a sniff of it, you had to prove that you had the money in an account, you had to advise us of the nature of your work, and we actually did the follow-up checks on it. This is where we caught a lot of people, sir, because GRCC flags people, so they would send a, a report to us saying negative reference. Negative reference could be anything from the fact that you had a conviction for a spliff when you were 16 up to you were on a watch list for treason or, or, or for, for terrorism. They give you negative reference and then they indicate the reasons for the negative reference. So in some instances, we even went beyond and, and requested further particulars. That is how stringent the security checking was on it. And most of the persons that we denied were persons who submitted fraudulent information with respect to their bank accounts. We were not able to, or even if we couldn't prove it was fraudulent, we were not able to verify to our satisfaction that you did not have everything you said that you have. So there's been no, to my knowledge, sir, no reason to revoke anybody because people went through the ringer before they were allowed to come on the welcome stamp. And yes, to answer the leader of opposition's question, most of the spin-off jobs were in relation to um, household-related things, gardeners, um, maids, housekeepers, cooks, nannies, babysitting, those sort of things. But I can get a breakdown for him. And he asked as well what he wanted to know exactly what was the actual benefit, monetary benefit uh, in specific sectors. I can check that, sir, but what I would say is that the monetary benefit was significantly more than we would have had for zero persons. So for all of the people that came here, the fact is straight off the bat, we got four to $6,000 from you. That totaled up to in excess of $4 million. And we definitely got the other spin-off benefits in relation to accommodation and whatnot. It would be a useful exercise, sir, to narrow that down and find out exactly what went into the higher car market and all the other things, sir, but I can assure the Honorable Leader of the Opposition that the benefit to Barbados was significantly greater than we had initially anticipated. And that is why we're pushing hard for the renewal because we want it to continue and we want to actually grow the program further. A lot of the countries, our source markets, sir, are going through a second wave or third wave or a fourth wave. And for us to keep doing what we're doing and to keep this opportunity open, and alive, again, provides the oxygen, sir, for it to grow. So I am comfortable. I hope I have, in some way, addressed most of the questions that the leader of the opposition had asked, and the ones that I haven't addressed, sir, I undertake to get back to him so that he can feel as comfortable with the program as I myself am. With those few words, sir, I beg that this be read a second time, sir. Questions that the aforementioned bill be read a second time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. Sir, I beg you, you do not leave the chair and host resolve itself into committee for further consideration of this bill. Thanks, Questions that the speaker do not leave the chair and the house resolve itself into committee for further consideration of this bill. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. This house is now in committee. Clause one. 
Madam Chair, I beg to move that Clause 1 stand part. Question is that Clause 1 stand part. <coughs> All honourable members in favour, please say aye. Aye. All those against, please say nay. We think the ayes have it. Clause 2. I beg to move that Clause 2 stand part. Question is that Clause 2 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. aye. All those against, please say nay. We think the ayes have it. Clause 3. I beg to move that Clause 3 stand part. Question is that Clause 3 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. Aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Clause 4. I beg to move that Clause 4 stand part. Question is that Clause 4 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. Aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Clause 5. I beg to move that Clause 5 stand part. Question is that Clause 5 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. Aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Clause 6. I beg to move that Clause 6 stand part. Question is that Clause 6 stand part. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. I beg that you do not report as honour the speaking the passing of one bill in committee. Question is that I do not report to his honour the speaker the passing of one bill in committee. All honourable members in favour, please say aye. Aye. All those against, please say nay. Me thinks the ayes have it. Chairman of committees is reporting the passing of one bill in committee. So I beg to move that this bill be read a third time. Question is that the aforementioned bill be ready a third time. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. Me think the ayes have it. Sir, I beg to move that this bill do not pass and be cited as the Remote Employment Amendment Bill 2021. The question is that the aforementioned bill be passed and so cited. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. Me think the ayes have it. This bill is passed and so cited. <laughs> Honor, Honorable Leader, Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with that, we have come to the end of today's sitting. I beg to move the adjournment of the House until July 6 at 10 a.m. Second that. The question is that this Honorable Chamber be adjourned until Tuesday, the 6th day of July at 10 a.m. in the forenoon. All those honorable members in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. We think the ayes have it. This honorable chairman stands adjourned until Tuesday, the 6th day of July at 10 a.m. in the forenoon.